everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I am so happy to see all of you. I know a lot of you. That's so exciting. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, as people jump in, I will go ahead and just get us started um, on some housekeeping and things. First of all, I'm Georgina. Um, I work here at the uh, Wichita State Community Engagement Institute as a partner of the Kansas Prevention Collaborative. And our mission on that side, our position is information dissemination. And so we are doing so today in this wonderful training with our wonderful people that we have on. Um, and that includes our partner brought to us from SpeedTech, Karen Abrams, thank you so much. As well as our facilitators that we have today, we have Carlton Hall, Dorothy Cheney, and Dave Glosson, amazing, amazing people. And so uh, they will introduce themselves in more in depth once they jump on to facilitate. However, um, in the meantime, I just wanna get some housekeeping tips out of the way. Uh, this meeting is recorded, and so you will be able to jump into that later on if you miss some pieces or um, you just want to review it again. Um, in the chat, I did just add a link to our demographic form. Um, that is just so that we know who we're reaching and if we need to reach more people. Um, it is our mission to get this information out to the people that truly need it. And so if you could fill that out for just one moment, that would be great. Um, and while you're doing that, I would like to say again, thank you so much for being here. We love that you're here and we are so excited for the information we have today. And also, um, I think that's it. I already told you that we are recording. So yeah, get that survey filled out really quickly. And then I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Carlton. Thank you so much. <laughs> Georgina, thank you. I appreciate you very, very much. I appreciate everyone for being here and thank you all for, for um, making this important enough to, to um, set your time to be able to do this with us today. We're looking forward to the conversation. We're looking forward to engaging with you all, um, having some, what I think are some important conversations and uh, also being able to kind of bring some real thought to the world work that we all are, that we all do. Um, and um, kind of listening and learning with and from each other about how we might be able to do that work even better um, as we're engaging the communities that we care for. Um, I want to add my thanks um, uh, it, to everyone that helped to make this possible. Um, uh, Dorothy, Dave, and I have been excited about trying to, uh, about getting here and about being with you all today. And so um, to the remarkable, remarkable team from KPCCI, um, Georgina and Chad, thank you so much for all the great work that you did in helping us to pull this off and, and bring this together. Thank you so much for the spirit with which you bring uh, to the work that we do. Um, it is infectious and I appreciate it. Um, Karen, um, the University of Oklahoma and Spitak, um, just a remarkable support that you all provide uh, to communities all over within your region. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for making this all possible. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, folks, um, we're going to be, I'm going to introduce myself and we'll introduce the team in just a moment. We have a pro we have an opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, but I just want to start off by sharing that we're going to uh, be engaged in conversations today. We're going to um, uh, have opportunities for us to kind of break into groups um, as we do in these Zoom sessions, you know that, right? And so we're gonna have some opportunity to be able to do that, um, to listen and learn with and from each other throughout uh, the course of this training and delivery. Um, we're gonna be engaging with you um, in the chat and we're hoping and asking you to participate within the chat as we are providing that. And feel free to just kind of engage as we're doing this. We set this up in a meeting setting so that you might be able to add your voice and bring your voice to the conversation. And so please uh, be mindful and, and um, uh, uh, let us know when you're when you're needing something or you want to contribute or you want to add something. We, we built in, we have plenty of time with us uh, and for us today. Um, but as we are doing this, we're going to bring energy throughout this delivery of this training. And so um, we built in breaks uh, throughout. So don't worry, we're going to get you to step away from that dag on screen, uh, you know, periodically throughout this time together so that you might be able to take care of other things as you might need to uh, through the course of this. Um, I'm, I'm also just wanting to share with you that due to the 
uh, the subject matter. We're going to be talking about understanding disparities. We're going to be talking about planning with cultural humility. We're going to be talking about a number of things about how we might engage with um, underserved populations and sectors uh, and how we might be able to do that better. As we're doing that, as we're having these conversations, um, there's a likelihood that some of the conversations and so I'm asking us to create the um, permission, if you will, for us to be able to have and engage in safe conversations where we take care of each other throughout this conversation and throughout the training that we're going to be delivering today. Um, I am so honored to work in this field of prevention, um, to work um, in, the, in the work that we do. Um, uh, I'm honored to be with you all. I'm honored to uh, be introduced to you guys. Um, and uh, I see some friends uh, and faces that I know. Uh, and and honored to um, be with you all. Um, thank you for doing what you do and being who you are um, during this um, time that we're trying to bring about change on behalf of, our, of the communities that we serve. And so with all of that, Thank you all. I'm going to do that thing we do in Zoom now and try to share my screen so that we might be able to do this well. Here we go. All right. And Georgina, if you can see my full slide, let me know that. Or are you, are you seeing anything else? You seeing the slide? Just as phenomenal. Slide. I love it when the when a when a plan comes together. I love that. I love that. Well, welcome again, everyone. So we are here uh, to have this conversation with you all about um, cultural humility and understanding disparities and how we might be able to apply that to our coalition work and our coalition efforts. Um, I am thankful uh, to be able to do this work with a few individuals here. And so hold on one second. Let me just make sure that I'm able to do this. Ding, ding, ding. There you go. Um, uh, with our remarkable, remarkable friends at SPITAC um, who helped us to kind of conceive this, to put this together, to think about kind of what would be relevant for you all. Um, and as we're doing that, um, Karen, I don't know if there's anything that you would like to share with respect to uh, this slide and with respect to SPITAC and kind of the, the um, anything that you want to offer to the folks? Sure. Thanks so much, Carlton. Um, SPTAC, the Strategic Prevention Technical Assistance Center for Region 6 and 7, our, our mission is to support um, all of SAMHSA's prevention grantees in achieving the goals of your prevention grants. Um, so we do this um, under a contract with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So just, you know, the, the standard thing that we like to say is that the views and opinions that are expressed today do not necessarily reflect those um, of CSAP, SAMHSA, or HHS. And that's pretty much it. I will hand it back to Carlton, and thanks to everybody for coming. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you, Karen. And so um, this is an acknowledgement uh, that we love uh, to be able to offer. And um, with respect to the conversation that we're having today, it's just vitally important that we all consider it and we understand um, uh, the history uh, of our nation and um, uh, those that we need to ensure that we respect and we show honor and tribute to. Um, and so we do acknowledge the traditional lands um, uh, of 574 um, tribes uh, and the fact that we are doing this collectively together uh, with respect to um, honoring um, uh, those peoples. Uh, we thank you for, for your support and for your efforts with respect to that. Um, Let's just share a couple of things. So uh, we're going to go through a little bit of an activity in just a quick moment uh, to make sure that everybody's technology works. 
but I want you all to feel free to engage, uh, feel free to unmute and speak when you need to. Please just kind of raise your hand or, or make sure that there's a gesture so that we know that you want to share something and state something so that we can acknowledge you uh, and then have you come forward uh, to be able to do that. Um, uh, we've been into this Zoom world for quite some time. We've been out here hanging out in these Zoom streets for quite a bit. And so we should, if you have any issues, have any challenges with uh, um, identifying where and how to utilize those gestures, uh, please let us know and we'll be okay to um, address that and handle that for you guys. My name is Carlton Hall, um, and I don't know where they got that picture of me. Someone did some digging to find that one. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I've been in the field for close, uh, more than 25 years. I, I, I don't say any more after that. Uh, folks just stop caring after 25. Uh, we've had the opportunity, uh, an extraordinary opportunity of working across this nation and trying to help folks apply um, the science of prevention uh, in ways that support community efforts um, for quite some time. I've had the extraordinary, extraordinary privilege of doing some work with some of you all there in your wonderful state. Uh, so I have some familiarity with um, those of you who are who are there in Kansas and and um, the great efforts that you all are doing. And so it is my privilege to be with you uh, here today. Um, and I am grateful to have two partners of mine uh, to co-present uh, this with me. I'm going to start off with Dorothy Cheney, and I'm going to allow Dorothy to introduce herself, uh, but uh, I will simply say to uh, you all that she's been an extraordinary partner of mine. We've been working together uh, for longer than I care to admit. Um, she is one of the uh, finest intellects that I know in this field of prevention, which is why at the, as soon as as soon as soon Chad and Karen and Georgina came to me, I went to Dorothy and said, hey, you mind playing in a sandbox with me today? I got some wonderful folks that we're going to be engaging with. And so Dorothy, please share a bit about yourself and introduce yourself. Awesome, thank you. That buildup was just ridiculously uh, kind. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I, you know, as I think about this content, I just wanna underscore what Carlton said, is this is a safe space. And yes, we have all been doing Zoom for a long time, but one of the things that our team, Dave and Carlton and I, really try to cultivate, especially when we've got enough time to actually digest some of this information and we're not running through it in 60 minutes is we're going to really try to cultivate like a classroom like think of it as a virtual classroom where we want you to feel comfortable to share and you know one of the things that I really really love about these opportunities is Carlton and Dave and I have some content to share but the most important thing is that we take as professionals in this field a minute to connect and to reflect and to process some of these concepts and especially thinking about cultural humility as a practice and addressing health disparities. I know I'm still learning. So we all learn together and this is gonna be a safe space for us to feel uncomfortable if we need to and to push through that and know that together we're lifting each other up in this field of prevention. And I can't think of a better cruise director for this time together than Carlton Hall. So I'm super excited to spend the next few hours with you guys and um, to learn from you as we process some of this really important stuff. So thank you, Carlton. Dorothy, thank you for being here and looking forward to tag teaming with you. Um, I, I also have my partner uh, in many endeavors uh, with me as well. Um, I don't have a remarkable picture of him uh, to share, but I would ask him to come on the screen. Dave Clawson, who will be kind of serving um, as our um, support with respect to making sure that you all are able to interact and engage well uh, throughout this training. And so, uh, Dave, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Yes. Hey, miss you all in Kansas. Uh, got to know many of you that are here in this space when I was the director of the Mid-America PETTC, so we got to hang out a lot. Chad, great to see you again as well. Um, yeah, I'm Dave Clausen. And I do what I do because I believe prevention is better together. And I also want to share a quote from one of my favorite authors, James Clear, and that wisdom is the echo of experience. 
And with that, and all of your experiences in this room tells me there's a lot of wisdom in this room as well. And we've crafted a, a wonderful experience for you all to share your wisdom with each other so we can learn together because together is better. That's it. Glad perfect, to be here. Perfect, Dave. Thank you. Starting off, starting off, starting us off with a deep quote. That's that's great. <laughs> that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Um, so let me make sure that we're able to kind of make sure that we are knowing who we're speaking to as well. And so on the screen, on the screen, uh, you all are seeing, I love word games, word puzzles and all that sorts, right? Um, what I'd like you to do very, very quickly, you don't have to put it into chat or anything of that nature. I just want you to identify the first word that you see. Just hold that, identify the first word that you see. I'm giving you 10 seconds to do that. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm asking you to hold on to that word, hold on to that word. And this is what I'd like you to do. Because we're going to be engaged for a bit. If this was about an hour, an hour and a half, I wouldn't go through this process. But because we're going to be with each other for a little bit of time here, um, I, it's important that everybody's able to interact and engage uh, via the technology. So it's important for us to kind of get and make sure that everybody is good with respect to that. It's also important for us to know who else is here as we're going to be engaging in a conversation. And so what I'm going to do is do a little bit of what we refer to as stacking here. I'm going to um, call out your names um, as I'm seeing them, as I'm seeing them. So hopefully if you can kind of uh, change your name and make sure I have an appropriate name by the time I get to you, that would be fantastic. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like to in introduce yourself, introduce your name, introduce if you if you represent an organization, your organization, um, the if you represent a specific community, what community you actually represent or work in. And then I want you to just share something about either yourself or your work that you want to share using the word that you that you identify. Just one sentence, one sentence, one sentence. And I am going to start off with Georgina, and then I'm going to go to Chad, and then I'm going to go to Heather. So Georgina, you up. Yep, Georgina here out of Wichita State in Wichita, Kansas. And the word I saw was proud. Um, and I am very proud of all of you for the work that you do in the communities and that direct service. And so that's why I'm here. <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal. Thank you. Um, so Chad, Heather, and then Lisa. Hi, everyone. Great to see you all and to be here with you. Um, Chad Childs, pronouns are he, him. I work for Community, Wichita State's Community Engagement Institute, and I live outside of Goddard, Kansas, um, which is kind of rural. Um, I, my word is brave, and I'm really honored to be in the presence of so many brave people working to change things in their communities. Perfect. Thank you so much, Chad. Thank you so much. And the Lisa that I spoke to was Lisa Roberts. I'll come to Lisa Cheney in just a bit, but I'm going to Heather, Lisa Robertson, and then Jody Love. Heather Winkleflake, I'm Wichita State Com um, Community Engagement Institute and part of the Kansas Prevention Collaborative, and my word was real. And I like to be real when I'm sharing and working with communities and recognize that it's real tough to do real good work. And so I appreciate that, that and our communities do a great job. Perfect. Thank you so much. Lisa Robertson, Jody, and then Stacy. Hey, Stacy. Well, hello, y'all. My name is Lisa Robertson, and I work at the Healthy Bourbon County Action Team. I'm a community health worker. And one of the first words I saw was funny, which is kind of ironic because I always try to use humor in life because life is so serious. And, you know, and I think my pat, can you hear me? We can hear you. We okay. can hear you. And, you know, so I always try to be a little bit funny, even though my kids say I'm not. So, <laughs> but I do try it. And I love your energy, Carlton. I just, if I could, you know, project that, I love it. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. And and none of our kids think we're funny. I'll uh, just say that. I think that's universal. <laughs> All right. Jody, Stacy, and then I have, is it Oakley? I have, I have Oakley. Wonderful. Looking forward to that. 
All right, I'm Jody Love and President and CEO of the Healthy Bourbon County Action Team. I'm here with Lisa Robertson. Uh, I think that the word that stu stood out to me was brave because this work is hard and it takes a lot of courage to do the work. And, you know, maybe some of us in, in new roles or different roles on, on being brave enough to reach outside of our comfort zone. Thank you, Jody. Thank you so much. Hey, Stacy, Stacy Oakley, and then Travis. Hi everybody, I'm Stacey Haynes and I'm a community support specialist with DECA. I serve out of our Wichita office and I serve the central region of the state, providing training and TA to all you wonderful, amazing folks here that do all the brave work. So I help you do the brave work in your community. So um, thank you for doing that and putting yourself out there and being courageous in what you do. And that was my word, brave. So remarkable. I worked, remarkable. I worked it in, Carlton. I worked it. I saw that. I, you were smooth <laughs> with it too. Smooth with it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go with Oakley, Travis, and then is it is it Kalia? Right. Kaylee. Kaylee, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And and don't mind me. It's my eyes. I'm old, y'all. So just 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 note just note that these little teeny letters is not helping me one bit. <laughs> go I'll ahead, Oakley. You got it. I'm Oakley Grant. I'm um, from Barber County, Kansas. Um, the Our existing coalition is Barber County United Health Coalition, and we're getting a prevention coalition off the ground now. Um, I'm the community mobilizer. And um, the word I saw was intelligent. And I feel pretty intelligent as I'm um, comprehending and retaining all this information that I'm gathering um, through this first year of training, um, and while I reach out to these community leaders and other people of the community, explaining to them everything that I'm learning, um, Perfect. I feel intelligent. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Oakley. Appreciate you. Um, Travis, uh, Kaylee, and then Lisa Cheney. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Travis. Rick Fram, the director for Live Well, Northwest Kansas. So, uh, we're a public health and early childhood agency in Northwest Kansas. So our office is based in Colby. Um, my word was cheerful. Um, and I was trying to find another word before it went off. Um, <laughs> because uh, um, I uh, one of those days I'm not feeling as cheerful. But then when I got on this phone call um, and seeing all of your cheerful faces, that, that was really helpful um, for today. Um, and so um, I appreciate that. Look how you turn that around. All right, my man. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. All right, Kaylee, Ch Lisa, and then is it Chelsea? Yes, Chelsea. Gotcha. Um, my name is Kaylee Stout. Um, I am an adolescent peer mentor, um, school-based services, and I work for CKF Addiction Treatment in Salina, Kansas. Um, my word is intelligent, and for me, intelligent um, isn't just a word, it's kind of an action. Um, and for me, it's also sharing prevention skills. And I think the most important is hope. So with not just the people that are struggling, but with the allies. So Love the entire that. community. Love that. Love that. Thank you so much for that. Lisa, Chelsea, and then I'm going to go to Abigail. And if folks can um, come on camera, that would be helpful. Hi, I'm Lisa Cheney. I'm with the Learning Tree Institute at Greenbush, and we have several evaluators that work with us, and along with uh, DECA, WSU, and, and KU provide supports for all the coalitions, uh, Jeremy Johnson and uh, Elise Nervous, and um, and so my word was hope, so following up on what Kaylee said, I am hopeful as far as our prevention supports. We have a great team, and our supports are really here to work together and provide the sports need for all of our prevention coalition. So I'm very hopeful for a successful, successful year this year and beyond. Love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Chelsea, then I'm going to go to Abigail and then Josh, you're on deck. My name is Chelsea Copeland Eberwine and I live in Saline County and I work for CKF Addiction Treatment as the um, manager of outreach and adolescent services. And my word was proud, and I am just proud to be a part of all of the work that we do and getting to see the growth. Um, and so, yeah. 
Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Abigail, Josh, and then I'm going to go to Janelle. Hey, Janelle. Am I next, Abigail? You're, you're next, Abigail. You're next. Yes, I'm Abigail, and I'm from Jewel County Health 365, which is in a clear up north in Mankato, Kansas, on the Nebraska line. And unfortunately, my word is amazing. I don't feel amazing but I feel like the work that we do is amazing. So I feel like we're making an amazing impact in our community. And it's been, this is our third year and it's just been exciting to see, like starting from a planning phase to being able to implement the strategies and stuff that we've developed. So it's exciting. Amen, amen, Thank amen. You. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Josh, Janelle, and then I'm gonna go to, I have Mike Isom on the iPad. Oh, you might not be able to do it if you're on the iPad, but we'll find out. All right. Uh, my name is Josh Via. I work for Wichita State Community Engagement Institute. Um, I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator. Cool. Um, I'm fairly new to the team, um, which is perfect because my word was hopeful. And so I am hopeful in learning new things um, as I progress within my role and also hopeful in the programs that we work with uh, to initiate great things for our community. I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Janelle, Mike, and then Mindy McCorkle. Hi, everyone. I'm Janelle Stang. I work with Wichita State University's Community Engagement Institute with Josh, Chad, Georgina, and Abby. And my word is heart. And Heather, I skipped Heather, sorry about that. Um, my word is heart and um, I just, there's a lot of heart on this call today and I really appreciate the heart that shows up in our work and also especially with my team at WSU. You're amazing, good to see you again. Um, uh, Mike Isom, uh, is, is it Marshall? Um, um, is it Michelle? Misha. And then Mike Parson. Parsons. Parsons. Okay, can can you hear me? I can. Are you guys all, all able to deal with the fact that I can't see and I'm too vain to put on my glasses? That's what's going on for, like, for real, guys. That's really what's going on. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry about that, my friend. <laughs> okay, I'm Mike Isom from the Smith County Drug and Alcohol Council in the Smith Center, right next door to Abby from Mankato. <clears throat> And uh, my word was hopeful, and my hope is that uh, whatever we are doing will make an impact and significantly change the lives of our young people. That's what it's all about. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. And forgive me if I'm messing this up. You'll correct me. I have Michelle, and then Mike Parsons, and then Mindy McCorkle. Yeah, I'm Michelle Caprice with DECA. I'm a community support specialist. I cover uh, Northwest Kansas. I have 29 counties um, in my region that I cover. Um, my word was hopeful, and I'm always just hopeful that we continue to make a positive impact in our community so that that continues to make a positive impact for the whole state. Michelle, forgive me for that. That was great. It's good to see you again, sis. Um, uh, Mike, Mindy, and then I have Kitty Hamilton. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Mike Parsons. I'm with DECA. I'm a prevention program manager. Um, I work with all the CSSs across the state and basically everyone else on this call. My word was amazing, and Abigail pretty much said what I was going to say, but I think the work that we do across the state is just amazing as a group. I thank you for sharing that, sir. Um, Mindy, Kitty, and then I'm going to go to Sarah Foreman. Hey, hi, my name is Mindy McCorkle and I am a community support specialist for the Southeast Kansas region. And I have cheerful and I try to always be cheerful, but I am very cheerful that I have an amazing team coworker wise and an amazing boss. And also um, I have the best coalitions you could ever ask for. And I know Lisa Robertson brought up something about how she wishes she had your energy. I don't think she realizes how much she really does because she is absolutely, absolutely amazing. So that's me. Beautiful, beautiful. I have Kitty, then Sarah, and then I have, is it Alexis? Hey, Alexis. Hi, I'm Kitty Hamilton. I'm with uh, 
the state of Kansas, the KDADS program. Um, I'm, I'm a prevention consultant, so we handle a lot of the contracts and the financials for the projects. Um, my word was cool, which I did not connect to at all. Um, and today's a very quiet day for me. I'm kind of off kilter, but yet I haven't turned on my propane heat yet. So yeah, cool. We're talking weather. It's cool. That's all right. That's all right. And as far as I'm concerned, you're cool to me. All right. So we're good. We're good. We're good. I got Sarah and then I got Alexis. And then I'm going to go to, is it Abby? Abby. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Foreman and I'm in Seward County. And the word I got by Kitty was cool. And I'm just going to say I'm grateful for the cool weather outside. Um, I'm Lee Bird and I am with Liberal Area Coalition for Families and work with Sarah. The word I got was pure and um, I, I don't know. I think that pure intentions, um, what we're doing for our communities, I think that's how, yeah. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I actually have two there connected, right? Correct. Wonderful. Yes, we're both. Thank you so much that. for joining us. Really appreciate that. Um, Alexis, Abby, uh, and then I'm going to go with, I see Jan Chandler. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm Alexis. I work for the state of Kansas. I am also a prevention consultant. Um, I work alongside Kitty. We handle the physical side of everything. And my word was amazing. And I'm pretty sure this has already been said, but it's just great hearing and seeing all the amazing work everyone's doing. Remarkable. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I have, here we go, Abby. Then Jan, and then is it Shelby? Shelby, yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Abby. It's really good to see all of your faces. I uh, My pronouns are she, her, and I work for Wichita State University's Community Engagement Institute. My word was emotional, which um, is funny because I feel like I, I am a very emotional person. Um, and I think that this work that we do also is very emotional. It's mm -hmm. easy to get it's easy to get drug into all of the emotions. And I think that in some ways that's great and in others it's really hard. And so I'm really thankful for the support of our team and all of the people here today. Thank you, Abby. Thank you very, very much. Um, Jen and then Shelby, and then we're gonna go to Emily. Hello, everybody. I'm Jan Chandler. I'm a community mobilizer with uh, Tobacco Free Wichita. Uh, my word for today was heart. I kind of, I guess I'm a twin to uh, Miss Stang. Um, just like she said, I think he, for me, I had to have a heart for this work that we do. So it won't be a job, just be something that I just do from my heart. And it makes it easier and even enjoyable, more enjoyable. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Jan, for joining us. I have Shelby and then Emily and then Jennifer. Hi, everyone. I'm Shelby Wiesner. I am um, the assistant researcher at uh, KU Center for Community Health and Development. And um, I'm with the process evaluation team. And so that means I get to see all of the special work that everyone does in their community and special happens to be the word um, that I saw. <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. Um, um, I have Emily, Jennifer Thompson, and then Jennifer Murphy. Um, can you see me? Okay, hi guys, I'm Emily. I didn't want to have to do this and turn on my camera because I'm putting on makeup, but I am listening. Um, I'm putting on makeup because I'm actually going to present one of the evidence-based programs we're going to implement to one of our districts this evening. Yeah. So I have a good excuse. Anyway, my word was skillful. That was the first one I saw. And see how skillful I am that I can be on the and I'm put on my makeup? Say. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I have Jennifer Murphy. Um, no, I'm sorry, Jennifer Thompson. 
Thank you. Sorry okay, that. that's all right. Oh, my name is Jennifer Thompson. I'm with the Thomas County Coalition, um, part of Live Well, excuse me, Northwest Kansas, located in Colby, Kansas. Um, the my word was love, and which I think is always great. Um, I think if we led more with love and let love kind of guide us, we would probably be in a much better place in society. Um, and I also love the work that we do. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. And Thank then you. I have Deanne Armstrong. I believe I pronounced that right. Deanne, are you there? You may have be having some issues or you might have stepped away for just a moment. Um, we'll get back to you when we come back. Um, is there anyone that I left out? I don't want to miss anyone. Is there anyone that I left out? Jennifer Murphy. Yes, I'm here. Hi, I'm Jennifer Murphy, hey. and I'm with Youth Educational Empowerment Program. And my word was amazing. And I've been listening to what everybody else is saying. So I'm going to try to be a little bit different. You all are amazing. I'm amazing. We're amazing. And this is an amazing work we're doing together. I love that. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Karen, for, for helping me out, helping me out there. When the cameras go off and on, people start switching around and it's hard for me to keep track <laughs> the best I could. Thank you guys for that. Thank you for, for um, allowing us to do that. Um, it takes a little bit of time to get through everyone, but it's very, very important for us to be able to hear who's here, for your voices to be a part of the room and part of the conversation early, and for us to be able to understand we have a range of experience and knowledge and perspectives here. And so I'm really, really looking forward to learning with and from each and every one of you um, as we are going through um, this training today. And so with that, I'm going to go back, sharing the screen and move us forward. Hold on. So today, what we're going to do, we're planning on making sure that we're able to address um, health equity impacts um, and finding ways to be able to do that well. Um, we're going to do a little bit of practicing with cultural humility and see how we might be able to apply the, that framework and those principles and the concepts to the work that we're doing and trying to make sure that our efforts are as inclusive as they ought to be in order for our efforts to be successful. We're going to talk about barriers. We're going to look at ways in which we might be able to think about how we could overcome those barriers um, in terms of looking at disparities data and how we might be able to incorporate in the work that we do. And here's kind of the way we're going to go through it today, right? We're going to have a conversation around cultural humility looking at it not merely from a theoretical um, um, aspect, but actually some practical application. How can we actually look at uh, that tool and help us? Talk about um, diverse sectors um, and how we might be able to engage them, define the ways in which we might be able to look at health disparities and those challenges that are associated with them. Talk a little bit about vulnerable communities and populations and ways in which we might be able to apply these concepts and these tools towards working and engaging with them. And then think about how we might be able to plan more effectively as we go through this process. As I shared with you earlier, we're going to go through this today and we're going to make sure that we're incorporating breaks throughout the day um, as we're engaging with each other. We will end promptly at the time that we're supposed to end. So don't worry about any of any of that. Um, uh, we'll work through this. But this training is intended for you to get out of it what you need to get out of it. And so. For that, I'm asking you to take on that responsibility. If we're coming across and we're sharing and presenting concepts uh, and ideas that you have some question about, or you want us to dig a little deeper in a particular area, please let us know that. Raise your hand, engage with us so that we might be able to um, apply and ensure that this training is giving you and providing you what you are looking for and what you need. And so I, I'd like to set the stage a bit. Um, I'm going to take on the first part of this conversation. Dorothy, chime in whenever you want as we do, uh, as we're doing these things. And then um, Dorothy is going to come in towards the second part of this training, kind of take us through some of those practical applications of these efforts. Um, but I want to 
talk a little bit about cultural humility and think help us to kind of think about why we're even having these conversations in terms of prevention efforts and particularly coalition work. Um, and so I'm gonna start off by sharing a little bit of a story. Um, um, I, as I shared, have been working in this field for quite, quite some time. Um, and I've worked all over the nation uh, with respect to it. This is actually a community that I happen to have been supported at one time. If you can see the date, you can see that this was a little bit of time ago. Um, and you all might recall back, you know, in 2018, 2017, um, while we are still dealing with the opioid crisis quite quite heavily um, throughout our, our nation and in our communities, during 2017, 2018, I would say that it was at a height, right? It was at the forefront of all of our conversations. It was at the forefront of every news kind of um, 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 telecast that you might see uh, and, and just very, very much at the forefront of what we were having um, as a national discourse, um, the rise of of uh, and the increase in the number of deaths that were really impacting community after community and county after county, folks were feeling it right there at their local levels. And as they were doing such, right, they were all, everyone was trying to figure out kind of how they might be able to come together and address this. In this particular county, the acting prosecutor uh, who, who happens to represent the highest law enforcement individual in that particular county, wanted to convene a meeting because of how serious the issue was in their particular county. And, and y'all, you all might be able to see, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the black marks there. Um, I've lived near Washington, D.C. for quite some time. Uh, you, you, you just learn to redact everything, so don't mind all of that, right? So, so this county prosecutor called a meeting to talk about the seriousness of the issue. In the chat, I'd like you to be able to share with me what's wrong with the picture. What do you see that's wrong with the picture? Hold on. We've got a few responses coming in, low audience, uh, a few people there, not enough people, empty not enough chairs, people in the room. empty chairs, empty chairs, just a few white people, just a, not a, just a few group. white people. All right. Not a diverse group. All right. There yep. you go. Yep. You're getting it. You're getting it. Excellent. Excellent. His positioning. Oh, wow. That's the first I've gotten that one. That's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. Lack of diversity. Remarkable, remarkable, remarkable. Thank you so much for that. And I, I'm here to share with you uh, that uh, the, the the woman that you see there kind of in the foreground actually works for the man. So the picture is actually worse than what it actually looks like, right? And the thing that I want to share here and the reason, no young people, excellent, excellent, excellent. <clears throat> the thing that I want to share here is that it really prompted me to think about kind of, well, who's responsible for this? Who's responsible for the emptiness of that room? With the seriousness of the issue, and we can all agree that it's serious, why is the room empty? Who's accountable for that? Is it the fact that those folks just didn't care? And I would argue against that. I would suggest that the reason why the room is empty is because the onus is actually upon those of us who are knowledgeable about the issue and are attempting to create change. And the onus is upon us to be able to do what I refer to as having new kind of conversation, right? And that conversation has to be on engagement. What we have to do is we have to begin to think about how is it that we're going to be able to reach out to those who need to be in the room with these discussions. I believe many of you will agree with me that that picture is not uncommon, unfortunately. That probably, likely, many of the coalitions that we work with or many of the efforts that we're attempting to do, we find ourselves sometimes in rooms that look very similar uh, to that. And I'm bringing this up because that 
in a nutshell, is really what this conversation today is truly about. I know we said we're going to talk about cultural humility. We're going to talk about health disparities. We're going to talk about practical tools. But the rationale behind all of that is because it's all about engagement, bottom line, right? And so how does this apply to your work in coalitions? Well, many of you who have been in this field for some time and doing the work that you do, you're already pretty familiar with the fact that coalitions really are attempting to apply prevention science to the work that they're doing, and that the prevention science that they're trying to apply is something that we refer to as the public health approach to prevention, right? And so if you've been trained as a coalition, you've likely been trained in the public health model. And that public health model suggest that we ought to be able to define the problem. We need to identify kind of the issues and the challenges that are associated with the host and the agent, the substances of misuse within our society. We need to define the problem. We need to identify those risk factors and protective factors that have a relevance to and a relationship to that defined problem, right? That's understanding the context of that environment. And once we understand the context of that environment, we come up with a comprehensive set of strategies that are proven, tested, effective, um, that have a, a research base to that so that we might be able to apply that to the risk factors, the protective factors, to the problem behaviors, to the consequential elements that are taking place that we want to address. These three steps that you see are typically, if you've been involved with this prevention work with coalitions, typically what you've been trained on. Typically how we've been doing this, we've been doing it this way for over 30, 30 years now that we've been applying this. But I would offer to you, if you would take a bit closer, look a bit closer, that there is a fourth step in the public health model approach that um, I, for one, have not heard a great, great deal about. We've heard a lot about those first three steps, but that fourth step that you see by the Institute of Medicine has talked about that we need to be able to assure the widespread adoption of the science and the prevention science that we all think is so vitally important for our communities. In other words, how do we reach beyond ourselves to engage the broader population in this conversation of change and in the work of change? How do we do that effectively? And the public health model approach says that if we are not doing that, we are not yet achieving the goals that we like to achieve. And so in a nutshell, we're going to spend time today on this fourth step. How do we engage the broader population to ensure the widespread adoption of the prevention science that we all think is vitally important for our communities. That's the reason for this conversation. And so if we're gonna have this conversation, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to start off um, by using a B word. And don't worry guys, I won't stay here too long, but the B word is important for our discussion, for our conversation. Bias comes into play. And the reason why it comes into play is because bias is something that we all have to contend with. And the only thing that I wanna share here is that the reason why we are having a conversation about bias, the reason why we're having a conversation about it at all, right? I know it sometimes gets sensitive, but the reason why we're having the conversation is because bias in peace the effective implementation of our prevention efforts. That's bottom line. That's the only goal that I have with this conversation is that we understand that under, not understanding and not being able to know, note our biases impedes our effectiveness in terms of implementing prevention efforts in our coalitions. So it's vitally important for us to have this conversation. Now, the one thing that I'd like to share is that bias is not about good guys and bad guys. Bias is not about, you know, you know, something negative about individuals or even about ourselves in a real sense. Bias is everywhere. Bias is with everyone. 
the one ways I'd like to think about this, one of the why this happens is because I, and I'm going to get into this a little further, but bias influences our scripts. And I'm going to delve into that a little more deeply in just a bit. But one of the ways in which I like to help folks think about this is because um, is by um, sharing uh, this kind of as a analogy or a metaphor. Uh, if, if you recognize what this thing is, somebody put that in the chat. Please, somebody let me know if you know what this thing is. I, I just want to I just want to make sure I'm in the right demo. I just want to make sure that I'm in the right demo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex oh, thank, thank goodness. Thank goodness. I'm with my people. I'm with my people. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. The Sony Walkman. And I'm telling you right now that if you have not had the experience of owning this, 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 this miracle of technology, you don't know what you're missing. I am telling you right now, this thing was the one of the greatest things ever invented ever, right? And, 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 and you, you, you had your cassette. You, it's the first time we could walk around with our music and be, you know, to have whatever we wanted to have. And I'm telling you that that ear, those earphones, you see those orange styrofoam things right there? I'm telling you, those things never fell off my head. I never lost them. They're better than any of these earbuds or ear pods or any other kind of beats or whatever it is that you all are using these days. I, they need to bring that back. Bring the orange styrofoam back is what I'm sharing, right? So, so, so here's the reason why I'm sharing this, right? I believe in a very, very real sense that all of us, all of us walk around with an invisible Walkman. All of us have an invisible Walkman on and our earphones on, and it has a cassette that's playing. And that's a cassette that we have been recording on our entire lives. All of us have it. And everything that we interact with, every conversation that we have, every time we're trying to engage folks in conversations, every time we're trying to engage a different community, everything that we're hearing and speaking is happening through the filters of that Walkman. We all have a Walkman on, right? And, and bias is with everyone. I, I, I am a hardcore, I was born and raised, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna win any friends there in Kansas, I already know this right now, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I was born and raised in Philadelphia. I am a hardcore Philadelphia Eagles fan. Yes, that's right. I said it. I said it. I'm proud of it. I am proud of it. I wasn't proud of that Super Bowl. I'm going to let you know that right now. I wasn't proud of that at all. But I am a hardcore Eagles fan. I'm telling you right now, as a hardcore Eagles fan, if I'm walking in a supermarket, and I see somebody walking by me and they have on a Dallas Cowboy hat. I don't even have to know that individual, but I'm telling you right now, the hair on the back of my neck just stands up. And I just, I just have, a, I'm just saying, I'm just being truthful about it. I'm just being truthful. It's just something that happens. There is a Walkman that is playing all the time with us, right? That Walkman influences our scripts. Let me share with you a little bit about how this actually plays out. We all have bias. And those bias informs and influences our scripts. And we all have scripts that we've memorized, right? Um, I was working in New York City um, and in the Inwood section of New York City. Um, some of you might recognize the name um, Lin-Manuel Miranda. Uh, you know, who did Hamilton and a number of other things. Uh, I, he's very, very well known. This is the community that he comes from. When he did his musical In the Heights, it was all about this community of Inwood that's in Washington Heights section of the city. I was invited to come and speak to the elders of that community and work with those folks. Um, and so I told you I come from Philadelphia. And because I come from Philadelphia, they had given me instructions I was staying in Midtown. They had given me instructions about how to get to their meeting in Inwood. Um, I had to get on the subway and catch a couple of connections, and then I would find my way there. Well, when you're when you come from Philadelphia, there's only one subway in Philadelphia. It goes up and it comes down. That's all it does, right? There's not like this whole complex system that they have in New York City. And the unwritten rule in Philadelphia is that you only take the subway if you can't afford 
a taxi. That's just basically the unknown, uh, the unwritten rule. And so I said, I can afford a taxi. And so um, when I got there and was trying to head to um, the meeting, I jumped in a taxi and after spending probably about 45 minutes um, going a block and a half because I was in Midtown during rush hour traffic, um, I, I quickly jumped out of that car, um, got in the subway, tried my best to remember instructions that I did not give any attention to, went on the wrong train in the wrong direction. I arrived at the meeting an hour and a half late for a meeting that they had set up for me. Um, North Central Philadelphia. I was working with a community in North Central Philadelphia, introducing prevention science to this neighborhood in North Central Philadelphia. Um, and as I was having a number of meetings, um, the meetings that I called, um, I, this woman, um, who is a remarkable woman, taught me more about prevention than I'll ever learn from any workshop. Her name was Miss Burdell McCray. I'll always be indebted to Miss Burdell. Uh, Miss Burdell came to me during one of my what I refer to as my meetings. Came to me and said, uh, uh, she just kept interrupting the meetings, interrupting the meetings, interrupting the meetings. And at the end of it, I said, Miss Burdell, you know, I let everybody go. I said, Miss Burdell, I said, is there something wrong? I'm a pretty nice guy. Did I say something wrong? You, you, you don't like me. Why, why don't you like me? Uh, and she just looked at me uh, as she did and just simply said to me, baby, I, I like you. In fact, I love you. But I even like some of the things that you got to say as I was talking to them about my risk factors and protective factors and social development strategies. And then she said, but you just don't respect us. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because I knew the intention that I had. But my approach was I was coming to that community to deliver training to them, to deliver a, the conversation I wanted them to have. She said, you never once asked us what we felt was important. last teacher. So I was delivering a training. And as I was delivering that training, a wonderful friend of mine, whom I had not seen in quite some time, comes up to me, gives me a hug, introduces themselves to me by using pronouns. It was the first time I'd ever heard of it. It was the first time I ever even heard, I didn't even, I didn't even, I was not even aware that that was something to consider, something that would be considered. And so this was some, some, some time ago, long time ago. And so in that moment, while I was professional, while I was, I was welcoming, why I was, why I was cordial, if you will, all of those things, all those ugly things. I know I was also awkward in that moment. And what I'm trying to say here, folks, is that part of this is the fact that we have an invisible Walkman that's on all the time. And we can't do anything about that Walkman. I mean, we can't take our Walkman off. We can't exchange the Walkman. We can't even change the tape. But what we can do is we can be aware that the Walkman exists. And if doing so, we can actually turn down the volume quite a bit. So even though I had the greatest of intentions, even though my whole desire was to do well in my prevention efforts in each of these areas, and I had fully intended to do so in each one of these, I would share with you that I was not my best self. It was not my best effort that there was something that did not occur, that could have occurred in order to make that um, um, interaction much more successful, right? And so I start off this conversation just simply by sharing with us that bias exists and that bias is with all of us in all of our ways. And we ought to be mindful of it. 
and I'm 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 looking at you all who who are choosing to be on camera and 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 on the screen, and I I can see you all judging me. Y'all are judging me. I see. I feel. I feel the judgment. Now, let me just do something real quick. Let me just do something real quick. Uh, what I'd like you to do is I'm going to put something on the screen and I want you to write in the chat exactly what you see. All right. I want you to do it. I'm only going to give you five seconds to do it. So go ahead. Write this phrase in the chat, please. I'm going to check now. Everybody participate. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Jumping to conclusions and jumping to conclusions. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, all of you, all of all of you, all of you are saying the same thing. Good. We're all on the same page. We, we're all in agreement with respect to what we see. Thank you very much. Um uh so so that's awkward. <laughs> right? Um, so, so here's, here's the thing, right? Why did we do that? Why did that happen? That happened because our brains are wired in a very particular kind of way. Our brains are wired so that we could take partial information and fill in the rest quickly in order for us to make quick decisions. It's just, it's just in the makeup of how we are wired, how our brains are made. How many of you will agree with me that even though you now know what this says, how many of you will agree with me that you cannot not see jumping to conclusions, right? Your, your brain is already doing what it needs to do. Your brain is filling in the gaps, right? That's what bias does. Bias fills in the gaps of our understanding and may have us jumping to conclusions, right? As we're looking at this, as we're trying to engage communities in this conversation of change. If you think back to the first slide that I offered in which the county prosecutor tried to engage that community in a vitally important conversation on behalf of that community, but yet it was an empty room, how much of that is because the ways in which we all, we he tried to communicate or they tried to communicate to that broader community was based upon some internal biases that they may have had, right? Unintentional, right? But there in which they were engaging with this. So I will share with you the part of what it is that I want to achieve with this, as we have this conversation of change, is to understand that we start by understanding our, mesmer our, our memorized scripts, right? Our memorized scripts of implicit and affinity bias as two kind of, of the most um, um, relevant um, types of biases. And this is, it's not relevant for me to, for you to be able to define implicit versus affinity. That's good. It's good for us to know. We're all professionals here. It's good for us to know as professionals. It's even more important to understand how it affects us, right? And, and one of the things that I really want to offer to you here Right? You see the definition of implicit bias, those beliefs, those feelings, those attitudes that affect our behavior, our decisions, and actions in an unconscious manner. Right, that's, that's me in the supermarket looking at a Dallas Cowboy fan. Right, That's what's going on there. Right, How much is implicit bias impacting the work that we do? How much are we aware of it or may not be aware of it? Affinity bias or in-group bias, that where we have the tendency or preference for people like ourselves, for 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 what what happens is we place value, more value, on those that kind of look like us, sound like us, believe like us, go through things like that, share experiences like us. There's a reason that that happens, right? I walk around, I see somebody with an Eagles jacket. My goodness, me and him, we're best friends immediately. Immediately, right? And it's part of, we, we strike up a conversation like that. I, I, I will share with you that if, if 
I'm walking up the street and, and another African-American gentleman is walking in the opposite direction, coming my way. If I give a little nod, what he's going to do is give a nod back. In that nod, we just exchanged a conversation that we're both very familiar with, very aware of. It happens instinctually, but it happens. It is a form of infinity bias. And what I'm trying to share with you is that I want you to get that bias is neither good or bad. It just exists. And as we understand this, we're able to apply it to our work. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to be able to um, uh, send us into groups for just 10 minutes. I'm going to give you, uh, yeah, yeah, 10 minutes. Mm, make it seven. Seven minutes. Sorry about that, buddy. I'm going to call an audible. Seven minutes. Right. In these groups, you're going to be mixed up. Don't worry about it. You guys get get friendly with each other when you get in there. Right. But you got five minutes. Right. In that five minutes, what I want you to do is I want you to think about how invisible Walkman, how our internal biases, how bias can affect our pre implementation of prevention and prevention efforts. What are some of the examples? What are some of the ways in which bias can affect our implementation of prevention, prevention efforts through our communities, our coalitions, all right? Why don't you just come up with a few examples, identify somebody that can be reported out for you all. I'm gonna give you uh, seven minutes. You're gonna have uh, five minutes to discuss, two minutes, you're gonna get the two minute warning and then we're gonna bring you back, all right? Everybody good? If everybody's good. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. And so, so let's just do this. Hold on. Hold on. Carlton, that went really fast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they always do. They always do. Welcome back, everybody. So, 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 um, I'm really, really interested in hearing from uh, a few of you, or a few of you, and we're right up on a break. So, I want to make sure that you're all able to kind of get a little bit of opportunity to stretch your legs a little bit, right? And so, uh, is there anyone? Is there anyone that is willing to kind of offer? kind of what the conversation might have been in your particular group. And I'm I'm going to start off with with volunteers first before I start volu volunteering. <laughs> Mike, I see you. I think I see you. You're either wiping your screen or you're waving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank I'm, you, sir. Okay, well, uh, Shelby and uh, from KU and uh, Abby from Mankato and I, we had a very uh, interesting conversation, but <clears throat> on how the uh, biases affect our, I guess you'd say perception of helping people and mm. getting the help that, uh, or, or having the public buy in to the, to the methods or the prevention methods that we're trying to do is a bias because they see how, especially out here in this rural area, they have a tend to look down their nose at people who abuse things. Mm -hmm. uh, like Abby and I were, were in this rural community. We grew up here. It's a rite of passage for young people to drink alcohol. Yeah. That is not really frowned upon by many people because their parents did it, their parents did it. So, so that's one thing you have to, have to battle is that type of bias. But yeah. I, we're referring to more uh, use of drugs or whatever. That is, people look down upon those people because they see them as less than, uh, I don't want to say human, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Less of a person because they do use or abuse. 
I I do. You you guys apply the 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 the, the breakout um, assignment expertly. That's exactly the conversations because it really brings to mind that this stuff is actually happening. It's happening in real time. It's happening with us as we are interacting with the folks that we're we're wanting to serve, right? And so being conscious of that provides us with the ability to begin to try to address that and redress some of some of that. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, toss the Frisbee, if you will. I, uh, can I come to, I'm, I'm going to be kind of bringing some, calling on some folks. I'm not calling on you to, to kind of uh, put you on the spot or embarrass anybody. I'm just, we're just facilitating the activity. If you have something to say, please. If you don't have anything to say, you can just say, uh, I need to pass this. Okay, you have that opportunity here. And so can I do that? And, and I'm going to send this over there to Heather. Heather, can I come to you? You're just kind of like right there for me. I, I saw yeah. your face. I saw your smile. That, that's what yeah. brought me. We, we actually had a great group discussion and really talked about um, different culture, you know, cultural differences and recognizing that, um, and I really hate to, to pass it to Mindy, but, you know, Mindy gave such a wonderful example that I hadn't thought about and um, it, it, it still is something to consider, but Mindy, do you mind if I, if I share your story or if you, you bring she, up or if you jump on? She's tossing the Frisbee to you, Mindy. No, it was, it was, it was, it really made me think. So either way, I'm fine with however. So, um, I don't know which part, cause I gave several examples. <laughs> well, the fam, about sharing about the family and the cultural difference. And then also with the, bu the abuse. And it was, it was, it was really, I mean, like I said, I'm still processing it, but I, and I love that because usually, you know, you have things and you think about it and then it's like, okay, no, but I'm still thinking. And it was great. Okay, um, I guess the first thing that I had brought up is um, we are becoming more um, in population with the Marshallese culture. And in my previous position before I came to DECA, um, you know, I had learned because I worked in homeless prevention and, you know, homelessness as a whole and domestic violence. And we would have a lot of incoming, you know, from the Marshallese um, sector. And one of their things um, that's the norm for them is they don't have to be related. They don't even have to hardly know each other, but if they're wanting children and they have children themselves, there's, you know, there's another Marshallese family that has children, they will actually give the other family their children. Mm. Um, to me, it was really hard to process. Like my first thought was, how could you do that? But then I'm like, okay, this is their culture. Like I have, who am I to judge? Who am I to, but it, it's something that I don't, I could never have a child handed over, but that's still, that's not what I've also, you know, was born and raised and grown up with. Um, but that's just what they do. And they would come in for assistance and, you know, they would list on their, their applications would be super long with the families. And sometimes there would be another family, but they would have another child's name on there. And that family had given their child to this other family. And it, it blew my mind at first, but then I'm like, okay, that's just, that's, that's who they are. Um, Child welfare wise, when I went through the education to become a social worker, and even when I went through taking my boards, they teach you to get rid of all your biases. And that includes um, pedophilia, mm -hmm. child abuse. And I worked with a lot of families with child abuse. Um, that that's still to this day a really hard hard thing for me to let go of because they're innocent children but then I still have to look at the other factor of the other persons that that's committing that abuse um but it's still to me I cannot and I think a lot of it's because I have children too but sure. it's one bias the abuse and the pedophilia the innocence of that from the child's perspective it's still a hard one I can't let go and then Stephanie joined it and she had amazing feedback but then I think she she got lost she got off I, mean, I think she hit the wrong button I think she had leave on accident but Stephanie's also a fellow social worker and she's been in child welfare for 27 years and she gave, gave an amazing example and she had a lot of insight on that as well but then we lost her so <laughs> Mindy Mindy thank you so much for that and Heather thank you so much for that um, and thank you for sharing um, um, some of those profound experiences. Um, it's all kind of there, it matters. Um, 
uh, we can see where and how it intersects with the work that we're doing, particularly if we're if it's upon us to serve that community, that constituency. Um, Jen, I'm going to throw you the Frisbee. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to throw it your way. Just going to look for one more example here. Hey, we talked about um, basically having fears, maybe that we were brought up with, maybe it's internally or externally, uh, being afraid to work with a population that maybe we've heard yeah. things about, uh, not really wanting to cross those boundaries. And really, the real deal is just fear, you know, fear of the unknown. What if I were to enact? Would I get hurt or something like that? And then something else that they said was having maybe the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. um, not being able to show up for who they really are as who they really are, um, just not letting the real person come forth and being able to um, address the biases or whatever. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you all to consider as we move forward, as we're going to continue this conversation, is uh, this was an exercise to, to help us illuminate for ourselves that bias is always at play. Bias is always there. When we have the responsibility of bringing, say, an evidence-based program to a particular community, the program has never been there before. We're going to apply that program, right? We may get into a mode of what I refer to as as paint by numbers kind of thing. You know, we 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 have the we 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 kind of know how to do the practice. We kind of put things in place, but if we don't take the time there are actually potentially inherent biases within the context of the delivery or the execution of that particular program, even though it's evidence-based. If you're trying to apply that program to a community that is a, that is a different demographic than the community in which that evidence-based program was actually initially kind of applied and, and, and tested with, um, there are things that come into play. And so, one of the things and one of the tools that we utilize is bringing up questions, thinking through questions, questions that bring out the potential of biases within the context of the delivery or the implementation or the evaluation of the programs that we might utilize and so that. We're gonna have some opportunity to kind of really think through some of that. Dorothy's gonna take us into amazing conversations when we get into developing plans around some of this. But what I'm going to do right now is give y'all a break. Y'all worked hard. And so I'm going to give you all a break. Uh, we're at 20, I'm going to say 25 after the hour. I see 23 after the hour, but I'm going to give us 25 after the hour. And then I'm going to ask us to come back in 10 minutes, y'all. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, I'm going to start talking whether you're here or not. All right? So 10 minutes, come back when the big hand gets on the seven. You all, thank you all. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate you guys. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, thank you for uh, that conversation around bias, around around um, how we kind of all need to be considerate of of how we interact with others and what may be impediments uh, to our ability to implement and execute on the approaches that were these on the programs and practices even on de in definition of the pro uh, when we're trying to define um some of the policies that we're trying to put into place right this conversation really has some real relevance um, with respect to that and so thank you for thinking about that and i'm sorry i wasn't able to get to everybody with respect to your your examples uh, but we'll have more opportunity for those conversations what i'd like to do now is i'd like to take us forward. Um, and part of what I want, want you to do, thank you all also for engaging in the chat um, with, with, with it. Um, uh, Lisa, thank you. It's a great, great, great example that you provided there in the chat uh, for us and for our consideration. You guys have conversations with each other as we're engaged in the chat around this, and we're going to try to pick a lot of that up uh, as we come forward. Uh, so... Let's do this. And so the question is, now that we understand these memorized scripts, 
kind of how it comes into play for us. What is it that we can do about this, right? Now, many of us have heard about cultural humility. I'm sure if you've been, if you're on the screen, you've been introduced at least to the concept of cultural humility, heard about it. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there are a number of you who have worked with this and worked with the concept of hum uh, cultural humility um, uh, for quite some time. The reason I'm bringing up cultural humility is because it provides for us a means by which we're able to actually address the invisible walkman that we have, right? Cultural humility is a willingness to suspend what we know or what we think we know about a person, a group, based upon generalizations about their culture or efforts, right? One of the ways and one of the things that I really want to pay attention ask us to pay attention to is that it shifts the focus from us trying to understand other people to a self-awareness. It's really kind of being conscious about who we are and what is it that we're bringing into the space. And what I really like are these, this term here, it is intentional and proactive. It is the intentional and proactive practice of learning and unlearning. That's the key thing. This is how we're able to turn the volume of our Walkman down, right? The intentional and proactive practice of learning and unlearning. Cultural humility really is um, brought to us and has, was, was defined and identified um, and then developed for our consideration uh, by these remarkable women, um, doctors um, Tavalan and Mari Garcia. Uh, and one of the things and one of the ideas that they brought uh, that I thought had, that actually shook me and had real relevance is, and it's what stuck with me was this idea of these scripts that we have, right? This is where I got that from. Uh, and part of what it is that their sharing is that cultural humility provides a way for us to unlearn or undo some of the scripts that we all have. And they have three principles or practices that are really kind of the three pillars of cultural humility. Lifelong learning and critical self-reflection is being one, that combination. The recognition and the challenge of power imbalances, and then institutional accountability. And so can someone share with me, just kind of raise your hand and then, uh, or unmute, just unmute yourself. Would you mind just sharing what you believe the difference between cultural competence and cultural humility might be? If someone has an idea of how would you frame the difference between cultural competence and cultural humility? I think the competence would be understanding and knowing what it is, and humility is being empathetic to the situation and understanding that part. I, I love that, Mindy. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Is there anybody willing to add to that or 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 provide uh, or 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 think that they want to add to that idea? I love that you hit the nail on the head, Mindy. And part of what it is that I want to sh offer us to think about is we tend to think about these terms, cultural competence and cultural humility, in terms of us from an individual perspective, right? We typically think about kind of cultural competence, cultural humility as it pertains to us as individuals. What I'd like to do is I'd like to add to that kind of understanding into our discussion by helping us to begin to think about how does this apply to us as we're leading coalitions or helping coalitions, right? And one of the ways that I want you to think about this is that cultural humility is really a framework for understanding and engaging, right? It is a way for us to take that practice of ongoing self-reflection and lifelong learning and recognition of those imbalances um, around and across all of the interactions that we might have as an organized effort, 
right? Coalitions, these organized efforts. How do we bring that? How do we make that happen? How do we infuse within our coalitions the ongoing process of self-examination, right? And so I want us to consider these three core elements of cultural humility, but I want us to go beyond just kind of being able to define them and to think about them kind of in terms of, of new language that we're kind of being introduced to. But I want you to think about it in the context of a coalition and what a coalition consider if it was trying to apply this key element. So for example, key element is lifelong learning and critical self-reflection. For our coalition, we're thinking about our members and we're thinking about those that we are engaging with professionally, continuously assessing our own biases and assumptions. Are we being intentional and proactive by giving and creating the space for us as a coalition to consider those biases and those assumptions that we have before we're um, implementing a best practice, for example, or before we interact and we engage, um, as uh, my friend Mike shared, we're going into uh, his community, but there are specific biases that are already at play just in terms of the, the people within that community and what's expected. And it's not just bias on our part, but it's bias on those that we're trying to serve part too, the way they think think about us coming in. How is it that we're able to kind of break through that? So I would suggest to you that part of what our opportunity is, is as a coalition creating the space and time for us to do that critical self-reflection. Coalitions also have the responsibility for understanding power dynamics that are at play, right? And, and, and um, uh, Mike, I don't want to pick on you, but you, you, I think, man, when you brought up kind of the work that you're doing in your rural communities, when I've had the privilege of working in rural communities and even in Appalachia, I understand that there are power dynamics that are often at play within those communities that are kind of the untold or the unspoken rules that everybody kind of goes by. And if you're unaware of them, you can be uh, and do some sometimes you can do some harm, but most times we wouldn't be as effective as, as possible, right? And so uh, there are, is the responsibility, accountability of the coalition to kind of understand what's going on, what those impacts might be, who are those sectors that may have been disenfranchised um, uh, that we need to consider. And then lastly, looking at the institutional accountability institutions, coalitions, organizations are responsible for creating the context and the environments that actually support the efforts that we're doing by encouraging the inclusion, the diversity, the equity, which is why we're intentional about those, those items and those aspects, right? It's not just add-ons, they're not just added considerations, but they should be part of how we're maintaining and holding ourselves accountable for ensuring that we are filling that room that that county prosecutor wanted to make sure that he had that in, in that conversation. Um, one of the ways and one of the examples that I'll bring up um, with respect to this is uh, when, uh, for example, we had the, um, um, uh, 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 we were beginning to work in uh, and with communities of color and attempting to engage communities of color in the opioid epidemic um, conversation, right? And, and the rising number of deaths that were happening in these communities uh, uh, was um, opportunities were being brought to them. Money was being provided to those communities. But yet when we went into those communities, most of those communities, many within those communities, many of the programs and the organizations within those communities kind of say, oh, no, 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 that's all right. Um, and I was looking at why was that happening? Why was that taking place? Well, at the time, most of the conversation about the opioid epidemic was about the misuse of prescription drugs, right? And it was primarily focused, a lot of the news attention was primarily focused 
on um, uh, white men or white women of a certain age grouping that was really kind of the, the major impacts uh, that was taking place there, right? And so when we went into uh, these communities of color, many within that community of color said, that's not a problem that affects us. That's not, you, you guys aren't talking with me. You guys aren't talking to me. Uh, and so even though we were coming with resources and support and, and the issues were definitely affecting uh, uh, those communities, they were resistant to the support and to the help that we were having. Why? Because the opioid epidemic played out differently in those communities. The opioid epidemic was not misuse of prescription drugs, but actually as a result of the mixture of drugs uh, that were taking place and synthetic um, opioids that were beginning to emerge uh, in these communities and wrecking, wrecking havoc, right? Uh, and so the conversations were different. Well, we have to be held accountable about how we are thinking about reaching out and ensuring that we are being inclusive in the conversations, even when those conversations are important conversations, like the conversations of and around the devastation that's taking place with respect to these um, um, uh, substance misuse epidemics that we are trying to achieve. So I just wanted to provide you all with an idea of how we think about these ideas within the context and the concept of, of a coalition. And so here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to give us some opportunity to go into our groups. You all have handouts that have been provided to you. Um, and if you don't have the handouts, what Dave is going to do is he's going to place this self-assessment tool in the, um, uh, uh, in the chat for you as well. So in your handout, you should have this cultural humility self-assessment tool. And what I'd like you to do in your group is there's two parts to this, and I'm going to provide you with a good bit of time for this particular activity. I'm going to provide you, this is going to be 15 minutes, 15 minutes. What I'd like you to do is the first part of the activity is I want you to just do this kind of individually. So for yourselves, even though you're going to be in the group individually, I want you to look at the self-assessment. I want you to actually kind of work through this, work through it just a bit, apply it to yourself, right? And just kind of do that. Um, at about five minutes and six minutes, and I'm going to check in with each of the groups. I'm going to check in with all of you all, but I want you all to then switch to a group conversation. And that group conversation, what I want you to address are these or some version of these questions, right? What surprised you with this tool? How do you think that this tool uh, can be used by you individually to advance your own cultural humility? And how do you think it might be able to be utilized on behalf of your work with coalitions, right? And then be prepared to have a conversation about that when you come back, all right? So we're gonna break you into the groups. We're gonna give you about 15 minutes to have this conversation, uh, check in. You're gonna have a, uh, a two minute warning uh, with respect to this. And so uh, if there are no questions, if there are any questions, raise your hand, but if there are no questions, Dave, I'm gonna say energize. There wasn't enough time. I was just about to say, we didn't have enough time. <laughs> if you like that, if you liked enough, you know, the time that you had, that's my fault. If you hated the fact that you got pulled out early, blame Dave. <laughs> it's just him. Blame him. All the bad marks go to Dave. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, so here, here it is. I'm trying my best to be good, Abigail. Here's, here's what it is that we're wanting to do. Um, the intent of that conversation, and thank you guys, I was able to go into a group and, and have some good conversation with some of the members uh, in that particular, particular group. Um, but what I'm really interested in hearing from you is um, your thoughts about the tool itself. Was it a tool that you found useful? 
or not? Is it useful for you? Is it useful for a coalition? If so, what were your thoughts about that? All right. And so what I would say is um, I'm going to do a couple of Frisbee tosses here. I'm going to start off and and Josh, man, you just popped up on the screen right when I was about to make that call. And so your energy is right there for me, man. Your energy <laughs> is right there for me, brother. So here's what I like to do. Um, just with respect to the tool. Any insights, any thoughts you have? And then I'm going to ask you to throw the first bead to another person on the screen. Um, yeah. So um I so looking at this tool, um, so I'm going to be completely uh, transparent on here. Um, Don't be transparent. So, <laughs> so I'm trying to this, save you. Don't be transparent. So, <laughs> well, when looking at this tool, I feel like it just depends on the person. Um, because it's, as a person of color, like looking at this, like some of it applies, yes, but others don't. Um, because it doesn't, you know, I can't really say like I'm, I value I value diverse perspectives and experiences. Whereas, I mean, as first color, like, of course I do. That's one of my values essentially. Right. Um, but others may feel differently. So it can't, it doesn't really measure with me um, as it would with someone else. Um, so I think that's, that's where I had kind of like a hard time with it. Cause when I did it, like nothing different stuck out to me. Whereas what I already, I already knew what the outcome was going to be. If that makes it. sense. It makes perfect sense. Thank you for okay. that. Thank you uh -huh. for that. That was wonderful. That's thank you for 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 that contribution and that offering. And and when I said don't be transparent, I thought for sure he was going to say I didn't even look at the daggone thing. <laughs> <laughs> no time for honesty now. <laughs> thank you for that, and thank you for that deep look into that and for that for that offering. This is the kind of thing that we want. This is a tool that was created. Fine. Is it perfect? No. Does it have some elements that could be helpful? Possibly. Let's find out. Let's see what it is that we can do. And are there ways that can be adapted and modified so that it can be even more useful for those that we're trying to work with and serve? Good, 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 good. Um, uh, toss that Frisbee to somebody, Josh. Let's go with uh, Chelsea Copeland. Hello. Um, I'm sorry. What was I supposed to? The the self assessment tool. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about it? Was it helpful? Not. Is it? Is um, it something that you found to, could be useful for your coalition or yourself? Yes, I think so too. Um, I I think yes because people, no matter who you are, you're in different places in your life, and sometimes that can change depending on what phase of your life you're in. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think too that sometimes we may have a belief or um, have an idea of how we understand or perceive something and you know we're really set in that and then as we learn and are educated that can change and shift. Um, so I, I do like this and I think it could be helpful um, if not anything to inspire conversations. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, and, and you get to throw the Frisbee to one other person. Last person. Um, Dorothy? <laughs> I'll take that Frisbee. I'll take that Frisbee. Do we want to have one? Other person share. I do have some thoughts to share, Carlton. So I'd do love it. to throw do it, it. Do it. Do it. Well so, done, Chelsea. Well done. I, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this was really helpful. I want to go back to Josh's comment, and then I want to build on Chelsea's comment because Josh, you know what? When when the teacher learns as much as they impart, I you know it's a good day for me. You know, when we think about those principles of cultural humility, right? That we're talking about which is lifelong learning. That's what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about that tool. One of the other elements of cultural humility is recognizing power imbalances. And when you were sharing, Josh, how from your perspective, you're living some of this because you you because that's your life, right? The diverse perspectives. 
there's a power imbalance in this tool. The power imbalance is written from the majority. And so thank you for bringing that so to light because this is an imperfect, imperfect tool because that power imbalance, which is one of those pillars of cultural humility is embedded right into that tool. Love that. Love I that. love, but, but I also want to build on what Chelsea said, right? Because there's definitely a use for this tool because that conversation that Josh prompted is really important for us to have, right? And for those of us who don't live experience of the diverse perspectives, like that sort of white privilege is built into this tool, right? But we also need to find pathways and not but, and we also need to find pathways to have these conversations and so like Chelsea said, this tool can be that conversation starter. And I think that like Josh, what you said, it's going to get really rich. This tool is going to have a whole other purpose when we bring those diverse perspectives, when they complete the, the tool and say, it's not the perfect tool. I think that's, I think that's great. And I think that I, I just love that conversation. So thank you both for sharing because I think both of those perspectives are super important. And when we think about those those really two strong pillars of understanding power imbalances and then also understanding that lifelong learning concept. And then that third pillar that Carlton introduced to us, which was also our institutional accountability and thinking about as coalitions, I want to make sure that we're naming and framing those three pillars of cultural humility before we go into the next part, which is looking at the data, which is looking at the data. And I'm going to bring up my slides in just a minute. One of the things that I've learned and why I'm so excited by this content is that we didn't just talk about how do we look at disparities in the data. And I'm really glad we didn't because before we start looking at the data, I want to just share one thing that I wrote down. When there was an amazing conversation about bias that and by, by the way, Guys, I already know the second half of the learning is not going to be the first half because I am no Carlton Hall. Sure. Every time he, every time the man opens his mouth, I take out notes. But one of the things that struck me as a prevention practitioner was when Carlton walked us through bias, there was something that was so valuable in saying it's not, it's not negative, it's not positive, it's just something that we need to be aware of. The other thing that I, what I wrote down is bias is a crosswalk to stigma. Because bias can lead to stigma, right? And then that stigma, as we know as practitioners, can lead to actions. Law enforcement saying, I don't carry insulin. I'm not going to carry Narcan. That's the way stigma operationalizes as a behavior. And so I love us having a minute to think about bias and cultural humility before we start looking at the data because we don't want to carry those biases into the data, because also what Carlton says is bias is going to fill in those gaps of knowledge. And so before we start looking at the data and the disparities that exist in the data, we want to do it with eyes wide open as opposed to eyes wide shut, because we don't want to further marginalize groups as we start looking at the data. Does that make sense? Dorothy, did you just say bias operationalizes as stigma? Is that what you just said? I did say that. That's freaking brilliant. 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 And it's, it's exactly what Mike was talking about when he was talking about working in the rural area and what some of the issues and challenges they have. Mike, that's part of what it is that you brought up, my friend. Thank you so much for doing that. I really, really appreciate that. And Dorothy, thank you for giving us some language to work with with respect to that. Um, tossing the mic to you, my friend, take us yep. forward. Yeah, no. And that was, it was Mike that, because just think about that, right? Like that there is a parallel between us being aware of bias and what we see reflected back on us in terms of behaviors that we're working on. And so, yeah, now let's go into the next piece that we're going to be talking about. Let me bring the slides up. And so it is not by accident that we, um, and so I'm going to say to Dave and um, Carlton, I'm not going to be able to watch the chat box as I normally do because I'm on my laptop today, so I don't have a second screen. So I got I'll do my best. Um, and there's been such good conversation in the chat box. 
So it is not by accident that we talked about cultural humility before we start looking at the data. And one of the things that I have learned as a practitioner over the years is, oh my gosh, with coalitions. You know, if we don't give our coalitions the tools before we give them the task, guess what's going to happen? They're going to have the best idea or the loudest voice is going to fill the room. So thinking about us looking at data and applying what we know as the science of prevention to our work, we know we need to look at the data, right? But we also need to make sure that before we look at the data, we provide the opportunities for our coalitions to have the tools that Carlton just gave us today. That we have the opportunity for our coalitions to reflect about things like bias and equity so that when we start looking at the data, our biases are not filling in those data gaps. So let's take a look at what we mean by looking at the, at the, at the data because we, we need to look at those health disparities because that's really at the heart of our work. And so let's start by defining disparities. Disparities are differences in health outcomes. It's that one group is being impacted in different ways than another group, and they're linked with those social determinants or social drivers of health. And so we want to look at those populations that are being impacted in more severe ways than other populations. That's the heart of our work is understanding that not everybody is being impacted in the same way and that there are some groups that are being impacted in more severe or more intense ways. And if we really want to be successful in addressing community health and substance use, we need to understand how those social determinants, those social drivers of health impact health equity and lead to health disparities. And they're everywhere we look. And so part of our job is to apply the science of prevention. But I'm gonna say it one more time. Before we start doing this work, we need to understand and practice the principles of cultural humility, of understanding that principle of lifelong learning, of understanding that there's power imbalances that we're gonna uncover in the data and understanding our institutional accountability, our responsibility as a coalition to come at this with um, humility. And I do invite anyone to stop at any time. Visual cues just don't exist on Zoom, especially when I only, I only have one screen. So please at any point say, hey, Dorothy, I invite it. Um, and also in, in the chat. So here's the spiff. I am gonna go out on a limb and say, most of us know the strategic prevention framework. It is our marching orders with uh, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It is our credible planning process. And at the heart of all of the work that we do is that we want to use this framework to reduce behavioral health disparities. We know that there are people in our community that are being impacted at higher rates than others, and it's reflected in the data. And that we're only going to be successful is we if we look at the strategic prevention framework, that process through the lens of equity. Of through the lens of how do we use this process to create a more just and equal society and in doing so address those health disparities. It's at the heart of our work. And so I wanted us to start out when we looked at this session thinking about what is the difference between cultural competence and cultural humility. And it was reflected in the chat box Cultural competence, if I had a magic wand, I wouldn't put cultural competence in the middle of the spiff. I'd put cultural humility because it's a more active process. And the strategic prevention framework is an iterative process. It's an active process that we're always working at in our communities. And so, so is cultural his, uh, humility. Now, I love these graphics. There's so many different graphics that explain the concept of equity, versus equality. And so this one is just a great one that illustrates when we think about the term equality, we think about the fact that everybody gets the same, uh, whatever, whatever their needs are, everybody gets the same thing. If we give all, if we give everybody the same thing, we're going to achieve equality. But that's not right because not everybody is starting at the same place. So if we just give everybody the same thing, we're not going to achieve equity in that everybody's arriving at the same destination. Equity understands the really important concept 
that what we really are working to achieve is giving everybody what they need, what it is that they need, understanding that some people are going to have different needs than others because some people have different barriers and challenges and conditions. And I'm going to go back to, we need to give our coalition members the tools before we give them the task. And so I'm going to ask for you to check in. Has anyone ever used this type of graphic with their coalition to have the conversation about equity versus equality, give people the opportunity to really process this and understand what we're talking about when we're talking about achieving equity. And I'd love you to either unmute or use the chat box. Has anyone ever used a diagram like this one or another one to have that conversation with your coalition about defining what equity means? Dorothy, I'll unmute. This is Georgina and I'll mention yeah. we do use um, similar photos um, regarding this kind of topic in our SAPS training. Um, and it's usually more of the um, three individuals trying to pick apples. Yes. Um, so there's that one or the typical over the fence trying to watch the baseball game. Um, yeah. How many people get, you know, one box to stand on versus the equity version of how many boxes they need. Yeah. Right. And then and then in, in that baseball game, sometimes the third the third is that there's fent the fence is taken away so that everyone has a free view and those barriers are taken away. I there's so many good ways of explaining it. Uh, it's so funny. Um, I'm in Green Bay because I just finished training a subs today um, uh, with some folks in Wisconsin. So love that curriculum. Um, so I love that it's embedded in the subs. I'm going to say, how many folks have actually taken it to the coalition and facilitated a conversation with your coalition around these concepts? Mm. And I'm going to say, if you haven't, I would say, add it to the list when you do this, the self-assessment, because we as practitioners, we study this stuff. You know, we have these conversations. We take time out of our busy day to do a four hour training with Dorothy and Carlton and the team to talk about this stuff. But think about the law enforcement officer who may be reluctant to carry Narcan that's coming to our coalition meetings. Think about the school superintendent who has no idea what to do, but they've gone from one ESL teacher to three in one year and it's not reflected in the data, but they know they've got a lot of low socioeconomic kids that are coming into the district. Just think about what a gift it would be to give your coalition the opportunity to talk about this and what it looks like in your community. Dorothy, uh, Stacy has shared with others uh, in the chat that this would be a fabulous conversation in the coalition setting. Yeah, guys, if there's one thing that I've learned over the years is that as practitioners, we have, we have, we have these great conversations we need to take them to our communities so that as we are working to even talk the language of saying, how do we address health disparities? What are we looking at the data? They're in it with us. They are understanding it. And what I really, really love about how Carlton set up this today was let's give people the opportunity to reflect on their own biases before we start moving into how are we going to fix it in the community? Because uh, was it was someone in the chat box said that um, that they heard um, in a training at Georgina said nothing about us without us. Let us make sure that before we start engaging our community, the full breadth of folks in our community, that we've had the opportunity to give our coalition members the opportunity to have these concepts. And, you know, and I'm going to tell you something, and this is not a political statement. Lord knows it's not a political statement. I was once doing this conversation um, with a group of folks and there was a. Um, there was a, a coalition sector that listened to the whole conversation about equity. And he leaned back in his chair and he said, so Dorothy, what you're telling us is that we need to be politically correct. And I, and I said, no, but it gave us the opportunity to have a conversation about what we're really talking about. It's not about being politically correct. It's about being equitable in the community and understanding the dynamics upon which our communities are built. And so if we don't have the opportunity to take these conversations to our coalition before we work to engage folks that are marginalized or disenfranchised, guess what? 
that person is taking their bias into the coalition meeting. And we want to make sure that we try to eliminate that. And so that's a really important piece. So put that on your list for a coalition meeting when you do strategic planning. So let's be on. So it really does behoove us as we are using the science of prevention to understand the connection between disparities and the work that we do. And so part of this, this is really another graphic of how we use that credible planning process. It really starts with us identifying those populations that are experiencing health disparities, who in our community is being impacted in different ways. And then it helps us identify and develop those strategies to address the gaps. But you know what? Nothing about us without us. So we need to make sure that we're comfortably providing um, opportunities to bring those folks to the table that are experiencing the disparities. And I am almost as old as dirt, but I'm not quite as old as dirt, but I've been in the game long enough to challenge my own assumptions. And so we used to use the language bringing people to the table. And, I, and I've stopped using that because there's never going to be one table. It's us going to the tables of the communities that we need to engage in this work so that we address the health disparities. So we want to identify those health disparities. We want to engage those groups by going to their tables and working with them, following that adage of nothing about us without us, to develop, divide, design, implement um, approaches that are going to address those disparities. Um, and, um, and then we're going to be able to improve those health outcomes for those groups. And that's what's going to help us long term. If we don't make a commitment to health equity, guess what's going to happen? We're not going to solve the problems in our community because embedded in behavioral health issues, behead, embedded in substance use, embedded in mental health issues are health disparities. And if we are not strategic and intentional about giving our coalitions the ability to understand cultural humility and then lead them into understanding how we look at disparities in our community, we're never going to be successful long term. We're going to have marginal successes, but we're not going to have meaningful successes. But you know what? It's not easy. It's not easy to talk about how do we address health disparities? How do we do it? And, you know, like, so here's just some like. How do we find time to do it? My God, Dorothy, we got so much to do. Now you're asking me to look at health disparities and health equity. How, oh, Dorothy, there's so many populations in my community. Who do I focus on? How do I start? Where do I start? Where do I find the partners? The numbers in our community are so small. How are we actually going to change? Um, how are we going to be able to measure that change? Um, sometimes it's even challenging to know where to begin. And I've just identified a few challenges here. Let me ask you, as we start thinking about looking at health equity and health disparities in the data and adding that to our work, what are some of the other challenges that you can think of um, for your coalition or for you as you're, as we're saying, all right, let's now look at the um, health disparities in the data. Well, Dorothy, that was something that we were talking about in our group before I was really cut off. <laughs> uh, That's all Carlton. <laughs> But no, no, Dave, no, Carlton says, <laughs> Dave, I'm leaving Dave. But anyway, um, you know, I think that it, as I, you know, travel around the country and, and have conversations uh, with different individuals who receive things from the federal government, there begins to be, um, in my opinion, and with our coalitions and with me, um, this sense of guilt because we have communities in Kansas that the data shows 96% homogenous. Mm -hmm. And so Carlton was mentioning, you know, you know, in those types of rural and frontier, for an example, there may be some individuals that are feeling left out. Mm -hmm. So there's this push and pull about the fact that we are evident, our program is evidence-based. Yep. that we are we are structured to look at our data and so in that it it almost seems seems also or by osmosis someone is going to be left out because you've got to serve the masses right, right. so that's kind of the push pull and the things that I like to talk to the coalitions about is you know, Cultural humility is not always about 
race and ethnicity. You know, we're very focused on our rural and frontier because that's where um, a lot of our um, disparities are. But this is more of a, a commentary and also a question um, that I was going to ask is, how do you have cultural humility while also recognizing that, hey, I'm being honest, there's there's nobody of color in my community except for a cow that may have a brown spot. Mm -hmm. And so, so what, what do we do? I love that question. And let me just say, as I frame my answer, Stephanie, that I'm, I'm a displaced Nova Scotian. So I came from the whitest community in the universe in Nova Scotia. Um, and I, I moved to the whitest community in mid Wisconsin called Marshfield. And um, so I, I live it. I was doing a strategic planning when I was the coalition director a few years ago, and I wanted to broach the conversation of cultural competence. And the police chief said to me, we've got no diversity here. We're all white, Dorothy. And I thought, oh, <laughs> sweet mother. I like because. And so, yes, it, 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 we need to go way beyond race and ethnicity when we're looking at. Um, culture and diversity. So I want to I want to talk to that because we're going to spend some time looking at the social determinants and social drivers of health. I'll tell you where I see the the inequities or the health disparities in the rural environment, which is really where I've spent I guess most of my time, is transportation, is socioeconomics, is access to technology, it's access to services, and those are really profound disparities that exist in the rural environment. I also want to say one other thing, though, is in the whitest of the white rural communities where I live, Carl can tell you, uh, my my greatest my greatest joy in life is my two biracial daughters that I that I raised, and they were the only children of color in their entire grade, and so what I also learned was that in the community where the numbers are so small that we don't think that the that sort of that diversity exists is sometimes the most marginalized people because not only are they other than, they're the only other than. And so the, the disparities sometimes are so pronounced where the numbers are so small. And that just adds even more complexity to it um, because there's no way that we can measure it in a, in a survey but those isolated African-American children that I raised in that white bread environment, they were really marginalized. Of course, mom ran for school board and was on the school board for six years. Did it help? No, but at least I was active and engaged, right? So I think that those, those, those um, are really important points. I think the social determinants really are important when we look at the rural environment because we're not gonna see that racial diversity. We do see, though, that there's a lot of hidden populations that aren't so hidden, but the LGBTQ plus IA population is absolutely present in those rural populations. The last thing I'll say about this in terms of the challenges, though, too, Stephanie, building on what you said, is we may not see anything reflected in the quantitative data because the numbers are so small. And that may be a barrier for us even looking at the data. And I think we need to acknowledge the value of qualitative data when we're looking at some of those smaller numbers or in those rural communities. But thank you. Did that, did that sort of respond to your question, Stephanie, or comment question, Stephanie? Yes, and I think that it's also good for our coalitions to hear um, because you know we do press the button. We do push the envelope. You know, this yeah. is, part of the spiff, but many times there is confusion and frustration because of how we define cultural competence and cultural humility. Yeah. And it's like, how does this apply to me? Because we're, we're not seeing it. And so right. it's good to hear it from someone much more learned than me. So yes. Well, thank you. Carlton's going to jump in. Thank you, Stephanie. Dark, and I'm sorry. Go. What'd you say, Dorothy? Go ahead. I, I was just going to add that um, uh, some really wonderful comments are coming into the chat for you uh, in, in terms of this conversation. Um, Stacy, thank you so much. I, I, I love the the example that you put. Cultural uh, Culture in a small community or a rural area may manifest um, maybe in the way of haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And are you engaging the have nots as well as the haves? 
And so just kind of just some food for thought in terms yeah. of in terms of different ways to, to look at it. So this conversation really is kind of expanding. I love that. You know, Stacy, when you thank you for that comment, you know what I thought of as Carlton was reading that is the way that I see some coalitions um and in the interest of full disclosure, I, I was a coalition director and then I became a, a trainer and a speaker for a while. And now I'm a coalition director again of a year one DFC. Um, so I'm back. I'm back in the trenches again. And um, and it feels good. Uh, it feels good. And it's hard. It's really hard. But you know what I was thinking? I was just thinking of that, Stacy, the other day when I was looking at we have a really robust and active youth engagement group in our coalition. And you know what? They're the athletes. They're the kids that are in the National Honor Society that are working on the resume. They're the white kids. They're the, right? And I'm thinking about the kid that's sitting in the cafeteria wearing the same t-shirt for the last three years that doesn't really have much in his lunch account. How are we not engaging those kids in a way that they feel comfortable coming to the table and feel equal and engaged. And I think that that's a huge piece that we need to be very strategic and intentional about how are we really engaging, not only, you know, the haves and the have not, that comes, that is particularly um, poignant with me when I think about how we engage youth and how we provide opportunities for youth to be engaged. And are we just engaging the National Honor Society uh, sports kids, or are we also seeking out those kids that are eating the lunch in the bathroom because they're being bullied because of what they're wearing in the cafeteria? Um, and I think that is a real tangible way that we need to really um, look at how we're looking at advancing equity. I love that. I love that. Stacy, being a yeah, DFC director is hard, um, but but you know what? We we can do hard things. So let's well, take a look. So I'm so glad that you said that. And, and I can't leave that conversation without saying this really quickly. That's yeah. another thing that, you know, I want my coalitions to understand. And we talk a lot, a lot about the definition of quote unquote primary prevention, however you define that. But looking at the fact that, you know, the, the youth that got caught in the bathroom with, you know, vaping or what have you, the, the youth that has struggled with different types of things. Those are the youth we want to engage as well, because you know what? They still are in our family. They're, and, and, and if you want to be really strict about the definition of primary prevention, they're still in that indicated That's area. Right. That's so, right. So, you know, look beyond, like you said, you know, those um, star which which I would I would argue to say that those stars have some skeletons in their closets as well. Um, yeah. But look beyond that and bring those other youth to the table that and don't stigmatize them because they have ex they have lived experience that's so valuable. I love it. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Great conversation, you guys. It is it is three forty because we're I know you're in the central time zone with me. I think let's give ourselves a quick five minute break and then we're going to move on to the next piece. Great discussion. Five minutes uh, and we will see you back here at three forty five. Give yourself a quick breather. Really good Welcome conversation. Back. And I want to I want to get started because we got some we got some content to yeah. to go through. Let's take a look at some of the data, and this is going to be a little bit didactic. But uh, so I am going to apologize in advance. But I want us to get to a point where we can have another discussion. So I want to get through some of the data though, because this is a really important piece. As a practitioner, we know that we need to be data driven, and I love some of these concepts to sort of help us. Uh, figure out how we're going to start or how we're going to go deeper into my into our community assessment. Now, as pr practitioners, my assumption is that you look at data because that's our world, right? We don't just jump into strategies. We diagnose what's happening in our communities, and then we align the right resources to what the issue looks like in our community. So think about, though, if we're looking at underage drinking as an issue, so we have a population of focus. So if we've got a population of focus, let's say we're going to be looking at youth. So we're going to be looking at youth. And so we know that we've got limited resources in the community. We're going to look at how we can address the issues facing youth. But we also want to look within that subpopulation or that population of focus deeper in to see who within that population is at higher risk and or experiencing health disparities. And so I 
um, I live in Wisconsin. I work all over the country, but I live in Wisconsin. And a few years ago, um, we were looking at working with youth and we had the opportunity to do some disaggregation. So we could do some cross tab analysis. We could go a little bit deeper into our student surveys. And so what we were able to discern was that within the youth population, we were seeing that in all of the school districts that we had asked us to the, to the cross tab data, so the, the detailed data, Data, what we were seeing is youth who were identifying as LGBTQ plus IA had about 50 or 60 percent higher use of alcohol, tobacco and THC than youth who didn't identify as such. And so why do we want to look at that data? Because we want to be able to then engage that group. We want to be able to align our interventions and meet those youth where they are. And so in that particular case, what we've started doing with our coalitions is connecting with PFLAG groups or um, the gay straight alliances in schools and working to engage that population in aligning um, strategies that look similar to what we're doing with the rest of the communities, but we're also understanding that there are unique sets of challenges with that particular population. Now that's an example of finding a subpopulation within our uh, population of focus. Sometimes you're not gonna have access to that quantitative data, but that's where focus groups are gonna come in handy. And so we wanna make sure that we're providing opportunities for qualitative data, for environmental scans, so that we're finding ways to identify and quantify what those disparities look like in the data. And so one way to really think about it is within your population of focus, how do we dive into and find those existing disparities? And so we, I always start. And so I love, I love, I love that Georgina mentioned the SAPS. It's one of my favorite trainings. And so we know that if you've gone through a SAPS or a SUPS, that we talk about starting our assessment with a question driven approach. We don't just start pulling data, we start by asking questions. And so when we think about this through the lens of identifying populations with disparities, we're going to ask questions again, a question driven approach. What data are available? Where are we finding the data? And the data may not be in our student survey. And I'll tell you one data that really helped me in my work this year as we were build, rebuilding our coalition and writing for the drug free grant was I did key stakeholder interviews with our school social workers and our service providers at the school, our mental health workers and our guidance counselors. And that's where, even though it wasn't showing up on the youth risk behavior survey, we found qualitative data that within the student population, we learned that little nugget that I shared a little while ago. We went from one ESL teacher to three ESL teachers in one year. What does that tell me? That tells me that we've got an emerging population of students who are learning English on the fly in high school and they're under the radar. We're not finding them in any quantitative data. So what data are available? So how are we able to find that data? And then how are we able to connect with that subpopulation to see if they've got higher prevalence of use or what the consequences are looking like and are they more severe? And we know that within every community, there are populations that are experiencing rates of substance use in different ways, in higher rates, and the consequences look different. This can also be in urban populations where there is over-policing, for example. So the consequences of having THC is going to be much greater in an area, an urban area where there's over-policing versus an, a rural area where there's under-policing and there's only two sheriff's deputies on in an entire county on a Saturday night. So where do we find that data? And it's not always, it's not always going to be in a survey. And especially in our communities, like Stephanie was saying, where the numbers are really low, we're going to have to be really strategic and intentional about finding how we ways for us to measure what's happening related to disparities. And I love this building on those that question-driven approach is looking at the questions of demographics. Who are the people in my neighborhood? Who is in my service area? Now, one of my favorite coalition activities of all time that I actually learned from the one and only Carlton Hall was to actually work with your coalition to draw your community's map. Still my favorite activity, Carlton. It's still my favorite activity to work with your coalition to draw your community's map. And I'm going to ask in the chat box, has anybody ever drawn their community map? I'm sure lots of you have, have drawn your community map with your coalition. And if you haven't done it, if you want to do it again, I love doing it because you know what it does? It gives you an opportunity to talk about 
who's in your community. And I see a comment coming into the chat. Georgina, it's so awesome. It's it's a great way for you to draw your community. What is the, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, it's such a great way to start a conversation about who lives in our community and are we engaging them? And in a rural community, you might say, okay, you know what? I'm countywide. Coalition meetings are in the south side of the, of the county. Has Have we ever even gone to the north part of the county? What's happening with the kids in the north part of the county? What even What is even happening in that part of the county? That is a great way to start that conversation about who's in my service area. I'll tell you, in my community, you know who's in my service area that never shows up on a survey, but it shows up when I draw my community map? Is the Amish. We have a huge Amish population. They do not complete surveys, people. But you know what? When I draw my community map, I see that we've got a huge population of Amish that we are in my service area. And that leads into who's not being reached? How do we access them? Who is in our service area and how do we find them? Stacy said, even split up your coalition to have groups. I love that to do it because you will find biases and assumptions. And you're also going to see everybody looks at the community a little bit differently. So it creates this beautiful levels or layers of maps. And then you can even build on that map by incorporating photo voice of different parts of the community and building on it, creating that picture of who's in my service area? How do we reach people? How do we engage those communities? And then what are the special needs of those populations that are being underserved? Guys, that I guarantee you, okay, we just planned three coalition meetings for folks that are working with coalition. <laughs> we're gonna do the assessment. We're gonna talk about the equity chart. We're gonna draw our community maps, just saying. That's going to be some really great, meaningful conversation. We're going to give them the tools, and then we're going to start talking about who lives in our community and talk about how do we reach them and who's the best person to reach them. And you know what? One of the things that I've had to learn over the years is that oftentimes I'm not the best person to connect with some other folks in my community. And even though I think that I'm the really nice, you know, everybody relates to me, I'm kind of a upper middle-aged white woman that doesn't necessarily relate to uh, all the people in my neighborhood. I may not be the best person to go out and outreach. Um, uh, so Georgina said, I remember an activity we did with youth. Youth is so amazing when youth draw their maps. Absolutely. Um, calling out biases on their own. I love it. I love it. See guys, love it. But there are some data sources that you can look at. And when I was looking at these, these lists, um, if you're a county level, so if your coalition or your service area is intra-county within a county, it's a little bit more difficult. But one of my favorite data sources when I'm looking at county level data are those county health rankings. The reason why I love those county health rankings and anybody who works with a state or local health department is going to know those county health rankings, they measure those social determinants or social drivers of health. So you're gonna be able to see demographics. You're gonna be able to see um, uh, transportation issues. You're gonna be able to see socioeconomics. Um, some other data sources that are really similar um, and they're state specific is pretty much every state has a state epidemiological outcomes work group, an SEOW. Many of them have now data dashboards. So in Canada, you've got data dashboards. There's the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey, which is the BRFSS. You've got the overdose data dashboards. All of those data that exist at the community, at the state level, um, that can help you start to identify those social drivers and social determinants of health. Youth surveys are also going to give you some of that information. So think about, and if you've got a community assessment, go back and go deeper into it. If you've got a document of a community assessment, add a section that talks about the social drivers and the social determinants, go deeper into your community assessment and focus on how do we identify some of those populations within our community. And I'm just, the theme of the day is really what Stephanie said about, especially in those rural communities, we have to look to find those disparities. They're not going to find us in those communities where it looks like on the first blush that we're all the same. We're just not. Um, Oh, that's amazing. So let me say, if you are an epidemiologist on this call, I am not an epi, but I do play one occasionally on TV, but I would invite any epi to um, to, uh, to, to, um, to to chime in. And there's yes. one thing I also wanted to say as you're chiming in, epis. We don't have to be epidemiologists 
we don't have to be epidemiologists to look at the data. Um, and so those are some, uh, I love that, Lisa, right? Like we don't have to be epis to, to know that we need to look at the data. And it's so funny. One, so often I, I was just working with a group of six health departments and counties and they were doing, it was, a, they were all brand new and I was helping walk them through this conversation. They were looking for disparities as they were doing their community health needs assessment, their public health mandated needs assessment. And they kept asking me, what are we looking for in the data? Dorothy, what are we looking for in the data? And the beautiful thing is the data are going to tell you themselves all you need to do is start looking at the data and you're going to start to see what is happening. You're going to be able to see the differences in treatment admissions from one end of the county to the next. And then you're going to do some qualitative data analysis to find out and go a little bit deeper and understand the story behind the data. And you're going to start to see those barriers that exist in your community. Those barriers are, are bringing us to where we need to understand those disparities that are leading to inequities in our community. Thank you, Dave Clawson. It's also understanding, we've talked about this too, that some of the numbers are gonna really be small. And there is, and that's why I need to say this one more time. That's why when we started this session, we didn't just start talking about data because we have to make sure that we are coming at this data with an attitude of humility and understanding that we have our own biases and we don't want to fill in those gaps with our own biases because it's going to be very easy for us to make some assumptions when we look at this data if we're not coming into it with a sense and a, a lens of humility. Um, oh, that's amazing. I see all of this great stuff that's going on in the chat box about um, how to connect with folks to, to get through this data and to analyze this data. That's the beauty of coalitions, guys, right? Like we don't have to be the experts in every way. We need to bring people to the table whose love language is data. And there are a lot of folks out there whose love language is data who will want to help us walk through this. And then our job becomes to look at it and make it real and incorporate it into the works and in our, in our approaches. So let me ask you, I want to just check in. We've talked about taking a closer look at the data. Um, think about your own communities. Um, do you have populations that are experiencing negative consequences at greater rates in your community? Watch populations. Think about your own community. So I shared in my community, I've seen two that I have uncovered when I look at the data. We've got students that are coming in with English as a second language that are having um, higher rates of substance use and mental health issues. We also have identified that uh, within our population of youth, LGBTQ plus IA are experiencing um, higher rates of substance use than youth who do not identify as such. Let me check in with you on your communities. What populations in your catchment areas are experiencing negative consequences at greater rates? Stacy said, if you're working, yes, if you're working in your, your SPIF process, those links are gonna come very, very helpful. Yes, and the, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me, um, we have, um, just had the, the opportunity to be awarded the SPF PFS uh, grant. And one of the focuses that, uh, based on the data, was um, our Hispanic um, yeah. youth and young adult population. Um, and so that would fit into the question that you just asked. Yes. So thank you, Stephanie. And I I love the part, I work a lot with the Partnership for Success grant. That's a real disparity based grant. It's a very competitive grant, as you know, and it really focuses on grantees identifying those um, disparate populations in their community or catchment area, whether it be state or regional or county. And the other piece that the Partnership for Success grant is requiring, and we're going to talk about it before we end, Stephanie, is the development of a disparity impact statement. So not only through that funding stream are you challenged to identify those disparate populations, but you're also challenged to develop an action plan, a statement of how you're gonna address it. So I love that. That's a really important conversation. Mindy, you're working with the unhoused population. 
You know, it's interesting. I was just recently working in Washington state and we were finding out that when we're looking at um, parent peer, populations that are experiencing more severe consequences, that there was a trend in the community where I worked in Washington state, where they were, where drug dealers were marketing specifically fentanyl laced uh, substances to the unhoused population. Uh, and so they were experiencing higher rates of overdose um, as we started looking at what was happening with that population. Um, citizenship, yes. And you know, Kitty, that's a really important one too, um, because especially like I was thinking in, in my community where we've got large, really large dairy farms. So we've got a lot of migrant workers that come in and they're not gonna be reflected on any surveys. And they're not going to be accessing services necessarily either um, because uh, issues of immigration and citizenship are at the fore with that particular group. But they're still groups that we need to engage and embrace um, and serve in our communities. Um, students of military families. And we know, Lisa, that one of the greatest risks uh, for um, substance use is families in transition. And military families are often in transition. They, they move around a lot. Um, and that is a risk factor in and of itself. And it's only at this point in the, the session did I show you this, uh, this disparity data. And so we often do see um, disparities in the data. Now here we can see um, alcohol-related, um, age-adjusted alcohol-related motor vehicle traffic crashes per 100,000 population, and we can see it by demographic. And so we can see that um, American Indian males have a much higher rate than American Indian females, but that they've got overall, you know, a much higher rate. And I I'm always really careful in looking at this type of data. And I'm gonna go back to what Carlton said earlier, is that our biases are gonna fill in the gaps. And so before we start looking at this data, we need to make sure that we're coming at it with a lens of cultural humility, because all this is telling us is that we have a story to learn about what's happening with that particular group. We don't know why, we don't wanna let our biases roll in and make some assumptions, but it just tells us we need to do some more digging to find out what the disparity is. We can see that one exists, but we don't know why. And we need to look a little bit deeper into our data to uncover what those factors are that are leading to that disparity. So let me ask another check-in question. Um, what data do you currently use um, to measure disparities in your community or what disparities do you observe locally in your community? Mm. And yes, Mindy, you are famous now that Carlton liked your uh, comment. Absolutely. Does anybody collect any data right now that can illustrate or that does illustrate health disparities? So I'm speaking for Bourbon County, actually. Um, and I don't know about the health disparity part, but I know in the beginning when I would be there, Lisa, she is so great and proactive. And um, I think access to medical care along with the yeah. financial portion of it. Um, I remember her speaking about an individual that had some severe, you know, um, tooth, you know, he had a tooth issue and she was doing everything in her power to try to, you know, get him the help that he needed, but it was a lack of funding, of course, no insurance. Yep. And she was doing everything that she could. So I think, you know, access to the clinics, because I think the, the closest one was about 30 miles away. Um, and it was just kind of like hitting your head against the wall. Like there's not enough resources or, you know, they shut down the hospital there quite a ways back. So um, I know she worked and I, I don't know the follow up on that. She can speak on that, but um, I know she was really working extremely hard to try to get, him the health care that he needed and so I think there's just a lack of that or a lack of you know assistance for people that can't afford insurance or are yeah. not housed or afford any of it and bless her heart she she 
and I don't know the outcome, but I know she was busting on top of everything else she does. She was busting, you know, her behind and dedicating so much time to try to get this one individual the help that he needed. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, a lot of times it is difficult to identify what those disparities are, but they are, um, but they are very prevalent in our community. Um, we're going to talk, and what you described was the social determinants or social drivers. And in just a moment, we're going to have a chance to, to process that or think about that or reflect on them for just a minute. But let's take a, a quick um, look at a little bit more closely at developing a plan to address health disparities. So a couple of things. Um, thinking about, and I love in the chat box, talking about the starting the SPIF process, looking deeper in your in your community to identify the, um, to go deeper into your community's data, to look at those social determinants, to look at those health disparities. But I also think, and these are just some reflection questions, you also have an opportunity when you're doing an assessment to assess your own coalition as well. Is, you know, we want to know what's happening in the community, but what's on the micro level in our, co in our coalition? Who is attending our training or educational events? Who is delivering the prevention services in our community? Because representation matters, right? Who sits on your coalition? Um, who participates in your youth group like we were talking about? Giving yourself the opportunity to look at a critical lens about how you operate. And I'll tell you, if we're not really strategic about this, it is very easy for us to become coalitions of homogeneous do-gooders who do things to people and not with people. And so as we're doing and looking at our community assessment, we also should really look at our coalition. And I'm going to go back to that there is not one table. Are we going into the parts of the community where we um, are most, you know, uh, where the, the disparities exist? And are we engaging the folks that we need to engage that we're making meaningful dif differences in our community? And this really is how do we how do we really find that data? So thinking about are there new populations coming in? thinking about school enrollment data. So thinking about where we're gonna be able to find um, information that's not going to be on the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey. Thinking about what are the, are the conditions in our community that may be resulting in disparity. So if you have not had an opportunity to do key stakeholder interviews or take your superintendent or your school administrators for coffee, that's a great way to start looking at what's happening with our student body because that's often a really good litmus test of what's happening in the community. Talking to public health, public health, they are, they are by mandate looking at those social determinants and social drivers of health. And in my, my day job, I do a lot of work with public health. And I'm telling you, in community health needs assessments, more and more things like um, transportation and access to health care are emerging as health priorities in communities now, it, it, even over chronic disease, because we're looking at those barriers as the causes of morbidity and mortality. So thinking about how we can be creative, use these slides. Somebody already said that with the, use these slides, sit down with a cup of coffee after this session and use these slides and say, where can I go to my community and find some of this data and who do I need to have conversations with so I can start to really get a more full picture of the disparities. Do it with an attitude of humility. We also want to look at the data by race, by gender, by socioeconomic status, by geographic locations. And then we want to really start to see the story of what's happening in our community and understand some of that context behind that disparity existing. And I, what I want to really introduce us to is, and thinking especially in um, rural areas, it's often geography. Geography is often one of the foundations of disparity. And this is the slide I wanted to get to. This is from the Centers for Disease Control, the social determinants of health. Just a word about words. A couple of years ago at the um, American Public Health Association conference, it was in Atlanta, um, there was discussion of the need to change this, the name of the social determinants of health to the social drivers of health, because determinants almost had a stronger, like it's going to absolutely determine, but they wanted to soften the language into social drivers of health. And I share that because the language is starting to change. And while the terminology still says determinants, if you hear it referred to as social drivers, they're still the same concepts. And those concepts are education, access, and quality. 
thinking about those communities where, for example, redlining may have occurred, guess what? They don't have access to the same education because the tax base isn't the same. So there's not the kind of uh, tax dollars to invest in public education. And education then is not the great equalizer because there's not, um, there's not equality across those school districts. Thinking about access to healthcare, thinking about the neighborhood and built environment. Is there access to services? Is there access to food? Thinking about the social and community context, thinking about racism, thinking about sexism, thinking about does this child that lives in a rural environment feel comfortable coming out and identifying as LGBTQ plus IA and thinking about those social socioeconomic factors that are influencing health. These social drivers or social determinants of health are critically important for us to really consider as we think about the work that we do in substance use. And in fact, we're gonna give you a chance to consider them. So we're gonna put you in five breakout groups and gr breakout group number one, I will assign it, I'll come in and make sure that you're assigned. Breakout number one, you're gonna look at the social driver of economic stability. So think about how financial stress, if you don't know where the next paycheck is coming or how you're gonna feed your kids, how that can contribute to substance misuse. Think about education access and quality and how that can um, impact substance use, especially among youth. Think about dropout rates. Think about the unhoused population of youth. Think about how that all impacts su substance use. Healthcare access and quality. Thinking about substance use, thinking about treatment and access to treatment with access to healthcare. Thinking about the neighborhood and built environment, how living in an unsafe environment or underserved neighborhood can contribute to those factors that go into substance use. And then the last group is gonna think about the social and community context. So we're gonna give you, and there is actually a worksheet for this. Yeah. So the worksheet you should have in your packet, but Dave is gonna put it in the chat box. And you're actually going to have discussion questions. So group number one is economic stability. Group number two is education access and quality. Group number three is healthcare access and quality. Four, neighborhood and built environment. Five, social and community context. And we're going to give, thank you, Dave. So your breakout group number is there. I'll make sure that you know. And then the discussion questions. Um, here are the discussion questions. I'm not going to read them. They're in the... Um, they're in the handout. And are we gonna give 15 minutes for this, Dave? Sure, so, you tell me. Uh, Carlton just told me it's gonna be a 10 minute breakout. Yeah. So each group is gonna be talking about a different social determinant. And we'll just ask each group to just give a 30 second report out of highlights of your conversation when you come back on the other side in 10 minutes. Questions of what we're asking you to do or what we're giving you the opportunity to discuss in the next 10 minutes. All right. So you have right. eight minutes with two minute countdown timer and the breakout rooms are titled with the the topic for you to focus on and discuss. Because Dave Clausen is just that good. <laughs> I was prepared. That's all. All, all right. right. See you on the other side. What they may be feeling. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. We're going to pretend that there's music playing. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Awesome. Um, okay. Josh said something hilarious. I know. We're going to wait for that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was his outro. As we like went back to the main room, he was like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. I got to tell you guys something in the interest of being transparent. So Carlton's going to give me a look like, what is she going to say? So here's the thing. This is the first time that I've done this activity in this way. When we're talking about the social determinants of health, I wanted to give us a chance to just dive into each one of those social drivers and just think about how does it impact substance use? So I'm loving it that Mindy said that there was a great discussion. I'm just 30 second report out from each group. Um, so group number one, you were looking at, at economic stability, um, just highlights of what you talked about related to the work that we do and economic stability. Who's gonna speak? 
Chad's trying not to speak. Chad's an amazing speaker. Come on, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Emily or Sarah, I want to give you both an opportunity. Emily, you got rudely interrupted by Dave Fossum. Would you mind reporting out for us? Or <laughs> Chad, you have brave in your name. You've got this. Chad. <laughs> oh, really, Chad? Come on. I have to go back and look at the questions. Well, just highlights um, of what you talked about related to economic stability and substance use, even just a treetop yeah. one. Um, I mean, we talked about how um, obviously substance use can exacerbate um, economic problems um, and how economic problems can exacerbate substance use. So yeah. it's kind of like this vicious cycle. Um, we were talking about, you know, what um, what was the last question you asked Chad about money? money being made whether you know is there yeah. are there yeah. are individuals making money off the substance or what else did you say what was the other option yeah. just asked if that was yeah. in your communities yeah. if that was a, a way so, to economic yeah. stability yep like is it helping the economy of our of your community and in a way it is you know we have vape shops and marijuana shops that are selling to yeah pro and selling to people they shouldn't be but it's also they they have a healthy business from it. So right. yeah, you know that. Thank you, thank you. First of all, Emily for um for taking for taking that one for the team. You know, Thanks, the other, what what I think about too, but just building on what you said really quickly is I was doing some work in Newark, New Jersey, a few years ago, and one of the disparities that came out as we started getting really deep into the work was there was a whole sort of subpopulation of older adults who were raising grandbabies because their children had an active substance use disorder. And so those grandparents were actually going and getting opioids from their doctor and selling them, not because they wanted to become drug dealers because they were putting food on the table for their babies. And like that health disparity of economic stability can be really profoundly impacting the issues related to substance use. And it's so complex. Um, so complex. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. So just treetop level highlights of what you talked about related to um, education, access and quality and how it impacts substance use in our communities. Who had group number two, just a quick treetop level response to what you talked about. Okay, so we visited about education, access and quality in our group. And I got nominated as the speaker because all of us are kind of rambling it's been a long afternoon and we're tired <laughs> so bear with me because I don't know if I'm much better but uh, we talked about the relationship between low educational attainment dropout rates substance misuse particularly a, 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 around uh, youth and we felt like there was a strong um uh, relationship between the two and it could be anything from like home you know, a lot of youth have traumatic events and systems set up for referrals and those kinds of things. Um, we talked about uh, some that this might not be like a unique challenge or factor to our community, but it still is a significant issue in the community uh, and some things that we could do to help address it. Um, Travis came up with a wonderful idea on the youth led initiatives to champion um some prevention campaigns, and then also uh, setting up systems for referrals and access to, to those types of um, services within the school. Like uh, Mindy talks about Lisa, our community health worker at the office here often, and she is phenomenal and she's just a great resource to have for those types of things too, so. I love that. And I think that's such an important piece. We often think about, um, thank you so much for that report. Uh, you know, as you were thinking, I'm also thinking about like early intervention in schools with kids, right? That 
there's an opportunity for us to make sure that we're setting them up to um, having a quality education from early on, because we know that academic failure too is a huge risk factor for substance use. So um, getting youth access to those services is really important. Um, Jody and Lisa make such a great team. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. The uh, group number three was talking about healthcare access and quality. I'll tell you with the opioid epidemic, this, this social determinant of health slaps me in the face in many communities where I work. Um, how about what you talked about related to social or to access to healthcare um, related to the work that we do in substance misuse? So um, I just want to apologize because when you put us all in groups, uh, Lisa, I completely forgot she's not able to access her audio and I'm calling her out like for her input. In. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized it when we broke back in. Um, but no, uh, I don't know if Stephanie wants to speak or however, I think we had some great conversation, um, because we went from like the stigma and people finding out, um, self medication, it's easier, you know, to turn around and grab a bottle sometimes and it is to admit you have an issue. And then if you have to go further for mental health, you know, mental health help, um, people are going to find out. And like, I, I mentioned, I was a little bit over 40 and, you know, when I was younger, 20 years ago, back then, if you needed mental health services, you're labeled as crazy or, yeah. you know, kids need ADHD medication when they're younger, then the parents don't want that stigma. It's like, my kids don't have an issue. Um, and then Stephanie brought up an amazing point. And that's why I love hearing her talk. So Stephanie, do you want to take yeah. over? I was just saying, you know, in this forum that we're in, you know, I just want to say, tell your story. Yeah. Because we learn from other cultures and other communities because I cannot identify growing up in Wichita, Kansas, which is an mm -hmm. urban community. If I went and got psychotropic medications, if I went to treatment, if I, nobody would know. I mean, but that is not to say that we have to discount the thoughts. I've heard people say, hey, I see my clients in Walmart. It's like, see your clients in Walmart, <laughs> that doesn't happen. So mm -hmm. it, it's really about learning from each other and telling the story and making it real for our state. Yes. That, that there's an understanding and a cultural humility that that may not be our experience, but there are other individuals that are experiencing that. And so how do we support, provide resources training strategies technical assistance to support that instead of just you know poo-pooing it you know and saying oh that's not real yeah oh that's brilliant stephanie thank you for sharing and you know thinking about stigma too is a, a huge piece when you guys were talking about that one of the things that i've seen um related to the social determinant of, of um, access to healthcare quality and stigma is a lot of healthcare providers, even though the waiver requirement for Suboxone no longer exists and it's easy to provide Suboxone in primary care, there's still a lot of stigma that providers aren't prescribing it because they don't want those kind of people in their office. And so access to healthcare quality is a huge determinant um, as a barrier for folks in accessing recovery uh, or, or harm reduction related to um, getting on medications for opioid use disorder. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Brilliant. Group number four was talking about our built environment and how that impacts substance use. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'll speak. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I guess I'll speak on our behalf, on our group's behalf. Basically, what we talked about is that um, when individuals are feeling or they're in a neighborhood, they don't. First of all, what I said is that it reminds me of the um, KCTC where it talked about having low attachment, neighborhood attachment, and mm -hmm. when you don't have attachment to your neighborhood or to people that that you live around, then you have a feeling of not feeling important, mm -hmm. uh, abandonment issues, you know, things of that sort. And so you things that you don't have control of, you want to have the relationship, but you don't. So you can have a relationship with a substance and then that gives you that ability to have some, some type of control, whether it's good control or bad. And usually whenever you're using a substance, it doesn't turn out that great. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things we talked about is that being resourceful uh, even though it might not be resourceful. 
advantage, you know, an advantage to you. But you're trying to, I guess, kind of heal yourself from within, from the things you're not getting from the outside. That's, you know, that's brilliant. As you were, as you were sharing that, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I think about as a prevention provider, building that protective factor, that connection to community is a protective factor. Mm -hmm. If you're disconnected from your community for whatever the reason, that becomes a risk factor and that isolation can lead to that self-medication and the substance use. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Last group is the social and community context discussion. I can do that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so social and community context, um, how does this really affect you um, in that court in that category? We just basically mentioned being isolated is going to be one of the number one um, risk factors in substance use because, um, well, I said we're social creatures regardless, but also I remember hearing that um, the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, but it's connection. And so understanding how being around others and having support is going to help you mentally, physically in every way, because um, we can become, you know, stuck to our vices or or just kind of stuck in our own heads and it can really become a struggle. And so I used Kitty's um, example at one point of, uh, you know, the individual who is maybe, you know, a young adult age who's um, in the basement playing video games most of the day. And it's like, how do we engage that person? How do we get a hold of them um, to make sure that their mental health and their um, ability to be, to have access to others is there? Maybe they only see their mother, you know, once a day rather than going out. And what reason would they have to go out? And so we talked a little bit about that kind of a barrier um, and then what would strategies be for coalitions. We talked about maybe some sort of like um, reason to come to the school. So like we talked about mixing people that don't necessarily get to talk. So maybe you have donuts with with officers at the school. And so um, that can help people get engaged with officers and it could potentially change, you know, their bias or the way that they see each other. And, and that, kind of in different ways to kind of having festivals or events. I think uh, Janelle, you used the example of um, parents night or families night out. Mm. Um, it's a great one, especially for rural communities because what do we hear in rural communities? Uh, there's nothing to do. And so if there's right. nothing to do, you either find something to do like in your own little group or, or you hang out by yourself. And so creating those kinds of positive alternatives is going to be a huge strategy. And again, those key barriers being the engagement piece. Um, how are we reaching them? Like, um, and if I miss anything else, please somebody else in the group speak. But I think we just essentially talked about how difficult life can be, especially when you're already isolated. Say you're on a farm and it's just you and your husband. And then one of your, your husband passes. Now, not only are you isolated, but you're, you're doubly isolated dealing with grief as well. And so it's just a lot of factors and, and additions there. <laughs> I love, I love that. And, you know, thank, thank you all for sharing and thank you for having that discussion. Um, that's one thing that we do see in, with older adults, that social isolation is one of the biggest risk factors for developing a substance use disorder later in life was when people go through those changes and they're lonely and they're, they don't have those social networks. And so like keeping in context, those social drivers or social determinants, how they impact our work is really, really, really important. What else is important is making sure that uh, you have the opportunity um, to reflect on the conversations that we had today before we say adieu. Um, so we just want to check in. This is the last piece that we're going to do. We would just love to know, first of all, I just want to say round of applause to Carlton for kicking off that amazing conversation that really set the stage for just such meaningful conversation with this group. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And keep it going for Dorothy. Keep it going for Dorothy. That's, um, but I want to know what are some takeaways that you have? And I just put it up on the slide, but I'm, I'm just, I just want to know what is one action step you're going to take or one takeaway. And I'm going to take the slide down because I don't want us to end on a slide. I want us to end uh, looking at each other. And so just one takeaway, one action that you're going to take as the result of our time together today. And if you all don't mind, those of you who are willing to come on screen, if you wouldn't mind doing that while we're, closing out. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Mindy says, my takeaway is that Carlton has some dance videos out there. <laughs> <laughs>
Mindy just won the day. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I got receipts. I got receipts. <laughs> wants to, oh, to email I'll me. Let... I'll send you the link. So I love what Kitty Travis, said. Travis, help me oh. out, man. Help me out, please. God. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to read a couple of chat box. Kitty, I love this. My Walkman is always playing the same song, even though I rarely notice it's playing. I love that. Um, Jan said, my takeaway is going to other tables. I love that. Love that. Love that. Anyone else? I think my favorite part was the jumping to conclusions thing. Yeah. Talking about how bias fills in the gaps because it's easy to forget mm -hmm. even if you think that you are on that self-assessment that you're in the more agree zone, you're probably not. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Yes, yes. Yes. I think I another that. big thing that Dorothy, you had brought up, I never even thought about providers not wanting those, you know, quote unquote type of people in their office. That never crossed my mind, but that is so true. So that's a huge takeaway for me. I love, I love what Josh offered in terms of the cultural humility self-assessment tool failing the cultural humility test. Yeah. I brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. Awesome. Love it. Well, with that, I'm going to thank you all for just being so active and engaged uh, over this really long session. And I'm going to just thank Carlton for the opportunity to, to participate in this. I learned as much as I had the opportunity to share. And so that makes for a good day for me. So thank you guys, everybody for the warm welcome and the opportunity to have these really cool conversations today. I, I want to thank you, Dorothy. Thank you so much for, for partnering with me to do this. Um, thank you, Dave. Uh, everybody give Dave a round of applause or a shout out or whatever. My man, he 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 keeps it going. He is he is a a, a substance use prevention expert in his own right, nationally known. And so his ability to kind of help in this way and kind of kind of support us uh is extraordinary. And I'm I'm grateful for every opportunity to partner with him. Um, I, for all the leadership, Karen and Chad and Georgina, Stephanie, everyone who is involved with making sure that we're able to do this. Thank you guys. Really, really do appreciate you all. Looking forward to the next conversation that we may have with some of you all. Looking forward to kind of taking this forward um, and, and doing that. We're going to confirm the date uh, to you all very, very shortly. Uh, Karen and I will be meeting just like really, really quickly after this. So you'll be getting that notice uh, very, very soon. But thank you all for that. And with that, I think what I'll do is turn this back over to Georgina for any final words or comments and and whatever it is that you all want to do. God thank bless. You. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are amazing. And I'm talking to all of you. Um, I am so happy that we were here together. And um, I did put in the chat, I'll throw it in there one more time. If you didn't do that demographic form when you entered, please get that out of the way. It's really short, no biggie. It's just so that we know we're reaching who we need to. But another side of that is purely thank you. If uh, you didn't have the time and dedication to this cause, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't make this, the striving uh, positions that we do. So thank you so much. I did want to mention actually my takeaway um, also being the, the how we fill um, these areas that may be a little more cloudy, but also understanding and realizing this was so easy and so fun together because we're all agreeable but then we got to go take it out to areas that aren't as agreeable. And so I want to just give us all the kind of the motivation, the hope, the all the words that we were using earlier in this training to go do that. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a fight. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, negative. It can be positive. And so I just push us all with the strength to do that um, in areas that aren't agreeable. And uh, that's pretty much it. Like you said, or like you heard from Carlton um, here soon, we'll have kind of that follow up for those of you who support the coalitions on this piece. And I'm super excited to see you again at some point. So until then, be safe and be kind and thank you. Mm -hmm.